If there's one thing America needs, it's more lawyers. Can you imagine a world without lawyers? Oh. It's been a very long time since I've dedicated a whole video to a video game. Not gonna lie, it feels pretty good to get back to my roots. Though, I gotta say, if you asked me a year ago what video game I'd be talking about, Ace Attorney would be nowhere near the top of the list. Heck, it may not even be in the top 50. Although, to confirm whether or not that's the case, well, that's a conversation between me and the people of Punky Doodle's Corners in Canada that I'm not looking forward to. But that's besides the point. Not gonna lie, Ace Attorney did not seem like the kind of game series that I would be into. I've always been more of a platformer guy, or even a puzzle game guy. Oh, oh god. Oh boy, I am not gonna hear the end of this. You jackass! Now you've done it, idiot! I'm a very busy man, so I needed something that I could pick up and play and put down relatively on the fly. I had seen people talking about it from time to time, and Phoenix even appeared as a playable character in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 Ultimate, so it definitely piqued my interest. Uh, it was actually on sale on the Nintendo Switch eShop in December of 2020 for like $10, and I wasn't a broke person back then, so I said sure, why not, and I bought the game. I didn't start playing until January of 2021, thinking, okay, I've got nothing else to play right now, so let me give this a shot. Needless to say, that was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. I was hooked on this more than I was hooked on phonics. I immediately fell in love with the game. Everything just clicked with me. The story, the structure, the mysteries, the gameplay, the problem solving, the soundtrack, and especially the characters. There's just something about this that was drawing me in, and for a time, I was completely hyperfixated on this franchise. I mean, I still kind of am, but back in early 2021, it was really bad. I wanted to find out what happened to the other games. I wanted to hear what people had to say. I wanted to listen to the soundtrack on repeat. I was a mess. Shut the fuck up. So I quickly played through the other two games in the trilogy, bought and played through most of the remaining mainline games I could on the 3DS, realized I forgot about the Investigations games, bought the first game on mobile because nope, Realized I forgot about the latent crossover, bought that digitally on 3DS because nope! Bought the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles on Switch because at that time it had been localized. Realized that I forgot about the second Investigations game, hacked my 3DS and downloaded a fan-translated ROM because nope! And here we are. I still wouldn't say the Ace Attorney franchise is my favorite series of all time, since that's a very high bar to cross but it's definitely in my top 10, that's how committed I am. So, just to show you all how great this series is that you probably already knew about because this game franchise has been around for how long? I wanna take you through my ranking of all the Ace Attorney cases from best to worst and try to give a good explanation as to why I feel the way I do for each case. A few ground rules before we start. Alongside the mainline games, I'll also be counting the cases from the spin-off games. That includes both Investigations games, both Great Ace Attorney games, and even the Leighton crossover. I will not be talking about the special episodes from the Leighton crossover or the Great Ace Attorney games, since those are just more so story add-ons and nice little extras than actual cases. I also will not be talking about the Asinine Attorney cases from Spirit of Justice, since those are more so joke cases that kind of poke fun at the game than actual cases. I will, however, be talking about the DLC cases from both Dual Destinies and Spirit of Justice since those are fully fledged cases and they add to stories of their respective games. I also won't be talking about the manga since I don't even know where to begin with all of that, and admittedly I haven't read all of it, since from what I can tell, it's not all in English. Finally, the anime will not affect how I rank these cases, this is primarily based on how they are in their respective games. However, I may bring up the anime every once in a while just to discuss a difference or something. 
Also, I may or may not have a surprise entry somewhere on this list, so be on the lookout for that. So with all of that, including the special entry that may or may not exist, we have 55 cases to cover. Oh dear god, what have I done? So sit back, relax, and be prepared to yell OBJECTION at your screen when you see a placement that you don't agree with, as we go through each and every case from worst to best, starting with... Now, when it comes to the worst case in the entire franchise, well, it's a little hard to say. There are a lot of factors that go into making a case good, and those same factors are contributing forces for what makes the case bad as well. Honestly, there isn't a case in the whole Ace Attorney franchise that I would say is irredeemably bad. I think every case has something going for it. In regards to the lost turnabout... Okay, just give me like a minute or two to think about this one. A lot of fans of this franchise know just how infamous this case is, but for those who don't know, allow me to explain. See, The Lost Turnabout is the first case of Justice For All, the second game of the franchise. The first case of basically every game doubles as a tutorial case, where it's the easiest case in the game, because it needs to teach you the ropes and mechanics, and in some cases, introduce you to the overlying story of the game. But that's harder than it sounds. See, the first game already had an introduction case. So, how do you go about reintroducing the gameplay mechanics to a player for another game? Well, in the case of Justice For All... Poorly. The big problem with this case, for me at least, is how it basically forces you to relearn the mechanics in an unintuitive and overdone cliché, even for the time this game was released. See, what if Phoenix Wright had to relearn how to play the game because he had... Amnesia. I gotta tell you, that, that, that sounds awful. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, this case relies solely on amnesia, and I can promise you that it isn't the last case to do so, but we'll get there when we get there. This just feels like extremely forced and contrived for this game, especially since it only affects this one case. Justice For All released only a year after the first game. You don't need to go through this monotonous excuse just to reteach the game. Especially since future games are able to do it in a much cleaner manner. The one good thing about this case is it introduces us to the defendant, Maggie Bird, but even then, this isn't her best appearance. The amnesia thing just drags this case down so much for me. Couple that with a lack of Maya for the first half of this case, and a culprit who is laughably inept to the point where he mistook a yellow baseball glove for a bunch of bananas, and just messed up every little aspect of his crime, and you have what is easily the worst case in the entire franchise. I mean, like for real? This case makes the first case of the first game look like a masterclass in game design. And, uh, speaking of that... I don't know if it's fair to put the first case of the whole series this low on the list, but at the same time, it is a pretty bad case, all things considered. To its credit, it actually does a pretty good job introducing the characters and story for the game that's about to take place. It also sets the tone, not only for the game, but for the entire series. This is the first impression that everyone is going to have when playing the franchise for the first time. And it's a pretty good first impression, but at the cost of being a pretty lousy case. I don't have as much to say about the first turnabout as I did with the lost turnabout. It suffers from a lot of the same problems. It's very short, laughably easy, and it has a villain that doesn't do a good job of covering its tracks. At the very least, though, Frank Sawitz's plan is a little better than Richard Wellington's, and it makes sense why this case is so easy and short. This is the proper introduction to characters like Phoenix Wright, Mia Fey, Larry Butts, and even the Judge. And it does a good job of making you feel like a rookie, since this is also Phoenix Wright's first case. If anything, this first case set a precedent for the remaining first cases of the franchise. Let's, uh... Let's just ignore the lost turnabout.
The Great Ace Attorney 1 is a great game. It's really cool to see the gameplay translate so well to feudal Japan and early 1900s London. And I am beyond happy that it and its sequel were properly translated and released here in the West, allowing more fans, like myself, the opportunity to play through these fantastic games. But it's not perfect. Far from it, in fact, when the second case, The Adventure of the Unbreakable Speckled Band, is this low on the list. This case is actually a first for the series. We've had a lot of cases where the entirety is just a trial, but this is the only case where the entirety is an investigation. And I'm kind of glad this wasn't a thing before because man, is this boring as sin, when in actuality, it has no right to be. The investigation is based around your best friend, Kazuya Asogi, being found dead in the cabin of his ship heading towards Europe, and you, the main character, Ryunosuke Naruhodo, being the primary suspect, since you snuck aboard to help out Kazuya on his adventure to become a defense attorney in the West. Now it's up to you to clear your name and find the true killer. Sounds intense, right? Problem number one. Under normal circumstances, it would be pretty interesting to have to clear your name for a murder you didn't commit, but we literally got this in the first case of the game. Two of the five cases of this game revolve around this, so you'll have to excuse me if I'm not extremely shocked by it. Problem number two. In this case, you are introduced to the legendary detective Herlock Sholmes, who is undoubtedly one of the best characters of the entire franchise. He is a great addition to the series, and the games would be a lot worse off without him. That being said, I might get a lot of flack for this. His introduction in this case is... not... good? He's supposed to be a charismatic genius detective who puts on a self-centered and narcissistic act, but he is very serious about the fight for what's right, and cares deeply about those close to him. In this case, he's kind of just an asshole? Like, yeah, he's supposed to be an asshole, but this case doesn't do a great job showing what else he has going for him. I know it's established later on in the game, but that doesn't mean they can't hint at it at all, or at the very least, toned down his more selfish side in this case. Problem number three. This is undoubtedly the biggest problem with the case, at least in my opinion. You get to investigate a whopping three rooms. I didn't say three T, I didn't say three teen, three. It might not seem like that big a deal, and honestly it really shouldn't be, but the problem is that the three rooms that you're investigating are your room on the ship, the room next to yours on the ship, and the hallway connecting said rooms. You go to these three rooms so many times. These three rooms that all have a very similar and bland style, by the way, that this case just drags on so much longer than it needs to. It's not all bad, though. I mean, you get introduced to deductions, a welcome mechanic introduced during the investigation segments that add a whole new layer to the Ace Attorney formula. But even then, these are pretty weak deduction segments compared to literally every other deduction in the two games. Barring the Investigations games, I really hope they don't do investigation-only cases in the future because if they're anything like this, I can already feel my eyelids getting heavy. Oh, but we're not quite done talking about the Great Ace Attorney 1 yet, because it's time to talk about the first case of the game. Like I said, The Great Ace Attorney 1 is a great game, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that these games leave a really bad first impression. The Adventure of the Great Departure seems fine on paper. It sets up these characters, foreshadows certain future events, sets forth the deep issues that these two games are trying to bring forth, all while doing a pretty good job of reintroducing players to the mechanics of the court system of Ace Attorney. Also, if we exclude the latent games, this is the first game to give us the multiple witness mechanic, where more than one witness takes the stand, and you can question the witness's reactions to another witness's testimony, which I think is a really cool addition. You're also the defendant this time around, which is a really cool twist, since this case is literally life or death for you. Unfortunately, it doesn't take long for the problems to rear their ugly head. 
This case goes on for way too long. The segment with the two witnesses is bloated without any actual sustenance, and it takes forever to get the actual culprit to the stand. And even then, she does whatever she can to drag this case on for way longer than it has any right to be. The average introduction case takes two hours to beat, maybe two and a half hours tops. The Adventure of the Great Departure can take you upwards of four hours. And that is if you know what you are doing. That is insane for a first case. I understand that they couldn't make it any shorter because they needed to introduce so much in one case. But because of that, it makes this one of the worst openings of an Ace Attorney game. I am glad I kept playing through, because this game gets so much better after the slog of the first two cases, but we have a bit to go before we get there. There's this term that gets thrown around in regards to the Ace Attorney games called Third Case Syndrome. Basically, it states that the third case of many Ace Attorney games, especially mainline games, are often the worst of their respective games. While this isn't the truth for a good amount of games, it definitely applies to enough of them for the term to hold some weight, as you're gonna see a lot of them towards the end of this list. And, uh, who boy are we starting with a doozy of a third case. I already have a lot of problems with Apollo Justice, uh, the character, and for the sake of this entry, the game. I think it might be my least favorite mainline Ace Attorney game, which is kind of sad, because there's also a lot about Apollo Justice that I really enjoy. I think it's the best-looking Ace Attorney game bar none. Clavier and Trucy are great additions to the cast, and while it's not my favorite in the series, the soundtrack for Apollo Justice is a damn banger. So you better believe that I was really excited when there was a whole case revolving around a murder at a rock concert. Like, that's a really cool idea right there. <sighs> there is a lot wrong with Turnabout Serenade, to the point where out of all the cases in the entire series, this might be the only one that managed to break my suspension of disbelief. For starters, while there are other cases where characters withhold vital information, this one feels like it's the least natural in terms of reasoning. Like, I get why a magician would want to keep their tricks a secret, but if it revolves around a murder, I mean, there's really no reason you should be fighting it. Also, the reveal of the true culprit, while a good breakdown scene, gets almost no reaction from Clavier, which honestly shouldn't be the case given everything this guy has gone through. And don't even get me started on the video. You can tell that they really wanted to boast the TOTALLY EPIC WON'T EVER GET OUTDATED RADICAL 3D graphics that the DS could pull off. Because they make you play this almost two minute video at least five times throughout the trial with no way to fast forward. Every time I close my eyes now, 3D orange clavier invades my mind. But undoubtedly, the worst part about this case is the fact that absolutely nothing makes sense when you take the defendant into account. Machi Tobai, a 14-year-old Borginian fake blind kid, is on the hot seat in this case. Which, I mean, based on the first testimony, should almost immediately rule him out. You see, the murder weapon is ruled to be a 4.5 caliber revolver very early on in this case. And something interesting about said revolver, something that's made extremely clear in this case, by the way, is that the gun has a very nasty recoil. It is so bad to the point where it could even cause a big guy's arm to be injured if he doesn't fire it properly. So then why does everyone think that it's possible that this tiny boy could possibly fire the gun and not have any injuries whatsoever? And twice for that matter! You're the smart one! How is this not extremely suspicious to you? The rest of this case doesn't fare much better in the logic department, unfortunately. See, not only does Machi get accused of killing a man with a gun that he absolutely should have been injured by, not only was he the prime suspect because he supposedly dragged this extremely tall, bulky, and heavy man's body to the stage, got him set up on the rising platform, and then knocked himself out next to him, but the case 
gets so complex that it gets to the point where this small 14 year old boy was apparently responsible for this extremely convoluted illegal contraband smuggling scheme that results in burning Clavier's guitar at the exact moment that a lyric of a song is sung? Yeah, this, this, this is a bad one. <laughs> um, it, it's really telling when the investigation scenes are infinitely better than the trial. 3D Orange Clavier will never leave me alone. And on a completely opposite side of the spectrum, we go directly from a case with a setting that I really enjoy, that being a rock concert venue, to a case with a setting that I don't very much like at all. A circus. Circus. <laughs> out of all the cases in the series, Turnabout Big Top is probably the case that most people outside the Ace Attorney ethos have heard of. And not for great reasons. This is another case of third case syndrome. And I bet a lot of people are probably shocked that I don't think it's the worst third case, let alone the worst case of the entire bunch. And while it's true that I did find some merit in this case that made it shine above five other cases, it just barely squeaked into the top 50. So clearly I'm not completely off my rocker. Only partially. <laughs> there is a lot wrong with Turnabout Big Top, and honestly, I could just spend the rest of the runtime of this video going over each and every flaw that this circus disaster of a case has, but I'll just try and summarize my thoughts. Even the worst cases can be saved by enjoyable characters, as we'll see later on. But this definitely isn't the case here. Whether it be Max Galactica, the egotistical showboat defendant who will fold at the slightest bit of pressure, Regina Berry, the sheltered daughter of the victim whose sparkly personality is... is really quite frankly annoying, Mo Curls who... Oh, oh, we'll get to Mo Curls soon enough. Hell, even the actual culprit of this case, the paraplegic acrobat Acro, isn't that great. While I do feel some sympathy towards his situation and understand his anger towards Regina Berry, who left his brother in a coma completely by accident, his plan was just way too over the top for his breakdown to land for me. The only characters that I don't mind are Ben and Trillo, the ventriloquist and his dummy. Or at least I would say that, if not for the fact that, for whatever reason, he's involved in a love triangle with Max Galactica and Regina Berry, whose ages, respectively, are 31, 21, and 16. If I'm a child, then you know what that makes you? A And I'll be damned if I'm gonna stand here and be lectured by a pervert. And throughout the entire case, they play up this idea that Regina Berry is somewhat irresistible to guys, including Phoenix and even the judge. You know, maybe Acro had a good point after all. And I haven't even gotten to the meat of this case yet. If you ignore the fact that Acro's plan made no sense, that suspicion on Max was caused by a one in a million chance, the overuse of this one circus song that isn't good, but they love to play it over and over again. Oh boy, I sure do love this somber circus music. I hope it plays throughout the majority of the case. And the fact that the first half of the first part of this trial is dedicated solely to the really uncomfortable love triangle. Oh God, please make it stop. This trial is decent. However, enter Mo Curls. I can forgive the unfunny jokes and humor, I mean, I'd be a hypocrite not to with how many times I've said awful puns, but I can't forgive his role in the trial. For whatever reason, in this single instance, in this one case for Justice For All, they implement a new rule where you can only press on the correct statement, or else you'll be penalized. All because everyone is tired of Mo's shtick and don't want to hear any more out of him other than what's necessary. This new rule comes completely out of nowhere, and while it isn't the only game to have it show up on a specific occasion, it's the one that makes the least amount of sense and definitely negatively affects the case. Now, with all that ranting in mind, you're probably shocked that I ranked it as high as I did. Well, to be fair, 
I honestly go back and forth from time to time as to whether Turnabout Big Top or Turnabout Serenade is better, and I've come to the following conclusion. Whereas Turnabout Serenade had a really exciting premise and setting wasted by a contradicting story with literally nothing making sense, Turnabout Big Top had a setting I could really care less about and characters that really drag it down, but other than those nitpicks I mentioned, it still manages to be fairly competent with its logic and reasoning. Ask me again tomorrow, I'll probably switch them up again. It feels like I've been going on long tangents with a lot of these cases recently, but I felt like it was important to elaborate as to what specifically made me dislike each and every case so far. Luckily, this next entry will be much shorter, as my disdain towards it is rather simple. To be honest, I was debating whether or not to put the latent crossover cases in this ranking, since, while at its core, it's still the trials that we've come to know and love from the Ace Attorney series, there's really nothing else quite like it. Nevertheless, it still technically contains cases, so I guess it's time to talk about the final Witch Trials. A lot of people who have played this game might be shocked that I'm placing the final trial as the worst in the game, as there's quite a bit to enjoy about it, and honestly, I wouldn't blame you if you said otherwise. But, you see, there's this one little thing that absolutely just does away with everything not only this case had, but the entirety of the game as well. The ending. It is very rare for me to feel negative towards something primarily because of a sour ending, but there are some times when the ending just completely goes against everything that you just sat through and witnessed, and in my opinion, this is one of those times. And honestly, I'm not even going to tell you guys what the ending is, not to torture you or to force you to play the game on your own, but explaining the ending would involve me having to go through almost every story beat that took place in this game, and honestly, I can feel my eyelids getting heavier by the second. Now, I want to make something clear. I've never actually played a Professor Layton game, and I have been told from some friends who are Layton fanatics that the ending to the crossover game falls in line with the textbook ending for the rest of the Layton games. I don't know, maybe if I were to play Layton games and then play this one again, I'd find more enjoyment. But as of now, it's barely making it into the top 50. Can't wait to see what the comments have to say after this one. I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but um, I am really not a fan of Spirit of Justice. People seem to really like this one, but man, I just do not care about it. It's not even me hating the game, because mechanically speaking, it's a very solid game. It's able to introduce new mechanics and actually spice up the gameplay, and it places us in Karine for half the time, a country that is completely new to us, but teased throughout the entirety of the series. My main problem is that I really, really do not care about the story all that much in Spirit of Justice. I could get into more details as to why I don't really gel with the vibe, but I think that's better saved for another day. Besides, my time would be better spent talking about how much of a bad first impression that the foreign turnabout gave me for this game. As far as first cases go, the foreign turnabout definitely isn't the worst. It actually does a good job introducing the players to all the new things that they need to know for the game, both in terms of mechanics with the divination seances that, admittedly while I like the concept, I'm not a huge fan of the execution, to the Defense Culpability Act, which again, great concept, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired. I also like how Phoenix is basically treated even worse than he was in the first game, since he's now defending in a completely new territory and doesn't understand the rules at first. It feels natural to the story that the game is trying to tell. Other than that, this case is just tedium incarnate. I don't like any of the characters introduced here, since they're either just really angry at Phoenix, or they're just to make a joke about punny names, which, I mean, yeah, I know the Ace Attorney games have always had terrible names, and that's kind of part of the joke, but here, it's turned up to 11 with some of these, like, I'll be your guide, pot roll, and peas lubbin on the standin, who, by the way, is probably one of the most annoying characters in the franchise. 
and everyone is just so bitter towards Phoenix, which I guess makes sense given the country just hates defense attorneys, but it gets way too cartoonishly evil at some points, even by Ace Attorney standards. They seriously turn Gaspin Payne, a guy with a cocky attitude who just really wanted to beat Phoenix right, into someone who actually wants to see him be murdered, and I'm sorry, but I just don't think that works at all. But honestly, I can forgive all of that if it wasn't for the fact that this case is paced horribly. Normally, introduction cases aren't supposed to take up that much time, or at the very least are supposed to have a quick pace so that the players can be reintroduced to the mechanics while also getting ready to step into the real meat of the game. This case can take you upwards of almost three hours to beat, which honestly wouldn't be such a big deal if it wasn't for the fact that A, a lot of the trial is taken up by repeating factors, like explaining the importance of the divination seance, the Defense Culpability Act, and the peanut gallery basically cheering for the death of Phoenix, which, by the way, so glad they have voices now, totally not annoying at all hearing it for the umpteenth time, and B, it takes you over half an hour before you can actually start playing through the game, which is absurd to say the least. It's not as bad as the Great Ace Attorney's first case, but the foreign turnabout is definitely one of the weaker intro cases to, in my opinion at least, one of the weaker Ace Attorney games. I can already hear those pitchforks being sharpened. Speaking of weak Ace Attorney games, I still haven't talked about the first Ace Attorney Investigations game. Now, okay, that's not entirely fair. This is the first and arguably only side game in the franchise where it shakes up the story, characters, and most importantly, the gameplay drastically. This game has a distinct lack of Phoenix Wright, so in his place, you play as Miles Edgeworth, the rival prosecutor and friend of the defense attorney. Right off the bat, that's kind of crazy, but it gets even crazier when you realize that, as the title informs you, this is a game based entirely on investigations, and there's no trials at all. This may seem like a step backwards, since the investigations were always the weakest part of the game for me, but they actually managed to add a lot of new mechanics to these side games that make the investigation mechanics fun. It's also cool to see these new and returning characters in a sort of overworld, since they'll be exploring the areas on foot this time around. I'd say more, but I think you get the general idea at this point. Unfortunately, I really don't think the story holds up all that well in the first game. In a game where you play as Miles Edgeworth, you really could be playing as any other prosecutor, as his presence in this game really doesn't leave an impression, and this is doubly true for the final case of the game, Turnabout Ablaze. Admittedly, it is satisfying to put an end to the Smuggling Ring storyline, something that I honestly did not care for at all, and it's actually really cool to see the Yadagarasu mystery play out and reach its natural conclusion, and it's a nice little bow on both Shilong Lang and Tyrell Bad's stories. I also really like the character of Callias Paleno, who seems like he's being set up as the culprit, but in actuality, he's just like a really nice dude. Other than that, though, I mean, yeah, I don't really like this case all that much. A lot of my problems with the final case really stem from the second half of it, but that doesn't mean the first half is flawless. While in concept, the embassy offices seem like a really cool place to have an investigation, in actuality, it gets really boring seeing the same areas over and over again. They also just really had to bring back Larry Butts and Wendy Oldbag for the final case of the game, which I mean, I can tolerate each on their own, but together I just think they really sour the mood. But really, the big problem does come from the latter half of this case, and it's all because of the true culprit, Quirkus Alba, the final boss of the game if you will. And they really love to rub that in in this case. What seems to be a feeble ambassador of Alabast turns out to be the commanding leader of the smuggling ring that has been the centralized focus of this case. This is all fine and dandy. What isn't so fine and dandy is the fact that from the reveal of Alba's true identity to his final breakdown, it can take over an hour and a half, over 90 minutes of this back and forth arguing. 
The Investigations 1 gameplay already doesn't lend itself well to long and drawn out cases, but the worst part is that a majority of the gameplay can be boiled down to Edgeworth accusing Alba, Alba being like, okay, but do you have evidence? Edgeworth presenting the evidence, and then Alba either having some insane counters to said evidence, or repeating the, okay, but extraterritorial rights bit which basically means he can't be tried in the U.S. courts, which basically makes him a free man. This goes on over and over and over again so many times that the final three parts of this game are almost entirely dedicated to Alba's questioning. Even characters that I love in this franchise should not be given this amount of exposure. And with a character that I really do not care about, in a game that has a story that I honestly really didn't feel for, yeah, you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Hey, so I feel like I didn't talk long enough about the first Ace Attorney Investigations game in the last entry. Luckily, we have another case from that game taking the spot right after it. That, um, that should, that should give you an idea of how I feel about the game. In my defense, the kidnapped turnabout isn't the most popular case in the Ace Attorney series, so I definitely feel justified in its placement here. That being said, it's not all bad. For starters, it introduces us to two great characters, Kay Faraday, the sidekick to Miles Edgeworth in the Investigations games, who is training to become the world's greatest thief, and Shi Long Lang, an Interpol agent from the Republic of Zhang Fa, who acts as sort of a rival towards Edgeworth. These two are sort of mainstays in their spin-off series, and they're very welcome additions. Another cool thing about this case is the setting. This might be one of the coolest settings in all of Ace Attorney. Seeing the different areas of an amusement park, such as the haunted house in the western area, almost makes up for all the problems this case has. Also, this case does a pretty good job of playing off the fact that, while in-universe they're apparently beloved characters, the Blue Badger's characters are very creepy and unwelcoming. Gotcha, scared you. This case has a lot going for it. Or it would if it weren't for the fact that every character in this case is just really badly written. I mentioned how I like Kay and Lang, but honestly, they really don't make lasting impressions in this case. Simply being introduced as troublemaking sidekick and thorn in your side rival with no other characteristics. Ace Attorney not only has a problem with first impressions for cases, but also character introductions. And while this isn't the worst case that exemplifies this problem, it definitely isn't the best either. We also have a slew of returning characters, and their contributions range from being undercooked and underutilized, in the case of Emma Sky, to an annoying obstacle to overcome, with Mike Meekins and... That's not to mention that their characters are tied heavily with the Blue Badger, a character I already wasn't very fond of, so you can kind of guess how I feel about them here. And the other new characters they introduce here are probably worse. Lauren Pops is fine, I guess? I understand she's supposed to be hammy and overdramatic in her dialogue, and sort of a red herring, but she's really just like one-dimensional, so I really don't care. Ernest Amano apparently has ties to both Edgeworth and Manfred von Karma, but they don't go anywhere with this plot, and then he's reduced to the secondary villain in this case. The main culprit, Lance Amano. This might just be the worst culprit in the series. See, he's actually the reason that we're at the amusement park in the first place, since Edgeworth is here to exchange money for his ransom, since he was kidnapped. However, the whole kidnapping scheme was staged by Lance to pay back his debt. This isn't the first stage kidnapping in the series, however, here's where things fall flat. Lance is a little bitch boy. I mean, that's really it. He's a spoiled whiny rich boy who thinks he's privileged and is completely out of his league with what he's getting wrapped up in. The twist can be seen from a mile away, and it's the least shocking reveal I think I've ever seen. So yeah, that's the kidnapped turnabout. 
Wow, two investigations, one case is in a row. Hopefully that's it for a bit. I mean, there's no chance that there's another investigations, one case next in the ranking, right? Right? Three investigations, one cases in a row. That is literally over half of the game that I don't think is all that good. Honestly though, Turnabout Visitor really isn't that bad a case. It's the first case of the entire investigation spinoff, and for what it is, it's fine. It does a good job of showcasing everything that's different about the series compared to the mainline games. I mean that in both an artistic standpoint, seeing the full body pixelated sprites having full movement to investigate areas and three quarter turned artwork showcased in the dialogue, as well as a gameplay standpoint, introducing logic, the main gimmick of the game. Side note, but I've always found it kind of funny that it's treated as like this special power akin to Apollo's bracelet or Phoenix's Magatama and it's just like Edgeworth using logic. It, it's very funny. I like that you're able to explore Edgeworth's office and the prosecutor's building in a whole new perspective. It is a mercifully short case, which after the previous cases I just talked about, I'm totally okay with. And the new characters they introduce are fine, I guess. There's like nothing wrong with them, and I actually really like their designs, but that's about it. And I think that's the big thing. There's nothing downright bad about Turnabout Visitor, but there's really nothing that makes it stand out either. I'd say that this case is definitely a turning point going forward. The, the previous 10 cases, I would say the negatives definitely outweigh the positives, making them some of the worst cases. But going forward, I don't think that there are many more cases that have that problem, or at the very least, the bad things that the cases have are, you know, sort of neutralized by something good. I don't know, man. I mean, honestly, I'm just really, really tired of talking about Investigations 1. I just want to be done with it for the time being, and I just I really hope that we're in the clear for a bit. Please? Dual Destinies is a game in the franchise that I actually really like a lot. It's definitely not my favorite game in the series. I think it has a few overlying problems that drag it down. It's effectively a reboot of the mainline games that, if you didn't know, could be very confusing for a lot of people. Yet, for some reason, they continue building up the Dark Age of the Law from Apollo Justice, which I don't think anybody who plays these games likes, or even at the very least, nobody takes seriously. This also marks the game where they effectively sideline Trucy Wright and Clavier Gavin, and I don't think I can ever forgive them for that transgression. The game also marks a transition from 2D to 3D, and while I think the anime cutscenes are a nice addition, the 3D models for this game are... They're bad. They're really bad. I don't like them. I have good things to say about the game too, trust me, but we'll save that for a little later. For now, however, let's talk about the game's second case, The Monstrous Turnabout. There are a few things that this case does that I actually enjoy. I mentioned how Ace Attorney has a hard time with first impressions of characters, but I'm happy to report that in the case of Simon Blackwell and Bobby Fulbright, that definitely isn't the case. Right from the start, you get a great look as to what to expect from these two, and it's just exemplified even more throughout the other cases. I also like how Apollo and Athena meet, it's very cute. And the defendant, Damien Tenma, is probably the best part of this case, adding some much needed humor while being equally intimidating and heartwarming. Other than that though, yeah, this case is just kind of really boring. And that's really sad when the premise is based around a mixture of a political murder, masked wrestlers, and a fucking yokai fight. I mean, how could they possibly make that boring? Well, it's quite simple, really. For starters, this investigation drags on and on, and it really gets boring examining the same places over and over again. At the same time, however, this case feels like the most hand-holdy, non-first case of the whole game. It's constantly telling you how to do things and where to go, and sometimes even just forcing you to go there. The other characters are also just kind of there? Jinxie is a friend of Trucy's, but as I mentioned before, Trucy just kind of yeets out of existence in this game, so there's really nothing going on with her that's endearing. Phineas Filch is basically just like a Danny DeVito character who steals things, and that's his whole character. And the culprit, LaBelle. 
I mean, he's probably the most obvious culprit in the whole series. His dialogue and mannerisms are extremely suspicious, and he's always got an evil look on his face. And if it wasn't obvious enough that the guy is a mustache-twirling villain, they literally show you him killing the Alderman in the opening cutscene, which... Okay, sure, I guess, it's still crazy obvious who it is. The monstrous turnabout is a case with a lot of potential that's brought down by an insane amount of fluff and embarrassingly easy gameplay. Luckily, Dual Destinies picks up after this, but we still have a little bit to go before then. In the meantime... Man, poor Athena. She literally cannot catch a break at all. She wasn't super well received at the launch of Dual Destinies from what I can tell. She has a really fucked up backstory that, uh, uh we'll, we'll get to that later. And despite being labeled as a main character, she's literally only playable for two and a half cases out of the 12 that she's in. Honestly, you could argue that she's really only playable in two cases, since Turnabout Storyteller is such a nothing case that it really only counts as half a case. In a vacuum, there really isn't a lot wrong with Turnabout Storyteller. Sure, the story is pretty dumb, revolving around noodle making, the defendant is more of a joke than an actual character, and this case introduces us to a character that... blew up Twitter. But there's also some really fun moments in this case as well. For starters, this case reintroduces Simon Blackwell to Spirit of Justice, and it's so good to see him again after dealing with arguably the worst prosecutor in the entire franchise, and I don't think that's a very unpopular opinion. This time, he actually helps Athena from the defense's side, acting as her assistant, which is a very welcome change. And other than the defendant, the new characters introduced are actually pretty interesting. Yuendo is a fascinating character, being a Rakugo storyteller while also suffering from dissociative identity disorder. He is also, like, one of the only red herrings that I think actually works, with his secret fourth personality that turns out to be nothing more than a little boy. And while Geru seems like an easy character to... clown on... I'd be lying if I said that she wasn't interesting with her impressive balloon skills and her weird motive. Here's the thing though. These are all fine in a vacuum. The problem is that this case is placed smack dab in the middle of two of the most important cases of Spirit of Justice. And like I said, while I don't care for the story of the game, even I was taken aback by the tonal whiplash of the placement of this case. It takes you out of the mood of the game entirely, and that's a shame because on its own, I don't necessarily think it's that bad a case. But its awkward placement, along with the fact that, for the time being, this is Athena's final case, makes it one of the most underwhelming and shockingly tone-deaf cases in the game. No amount of Plessy can save this case from where it stands. Remember not too long ago, when I said that Athena really only has two and a half cases where she's playable? Well, Turnabout Countdown is the half. You play as her for... God, you know, I was gonna say like half the case, but now that I think about it, I don't even think it's a quarter of the case, which is... It's just sad. This is the first case in Dual Destinies, and for what it is, it's fine, I guess? It has a lot of the same problems as Turnabout Visitor. It has some good stuff, but the bad stuff kind of neutralizes it. I like that this isn't just a simple murder, and is instead a death caused by a courtroom bombing, and we need to figure out who caused the explosion. That ups the stakes, despite being shown the culprit. Speaking of, Ted Tone is pretty cartoonishly evil, but unlike LaBelle, he's able to put his money where his mouth is and is very skilled in his craft. At the very least, he gets the job done for this first case. On the downside, this technically isn't the first case of the game. So a lot of the first case problems that affect a lot of other cases in the series are pretty inexcusable here. To clarify, the cases in Dual Destinies technically take place in a sort of non-chronological order. So really, the second case is the first case, the sixth case is the second case, and this case, weirdly enough, 
takes place in the middle of the fourth case, which I, I know that sounds kind of confusing, but because of that, a lot of what happens in this first case of the game is pretty ridiculous. For example, Athena freaks out over Gaspin Payne's prosecuting tactics, despite being one of the easiest prosecutors in the series, and is unable to keep defending the case, yet she just defended the same person on trial in a much more difficult case, and did it with little to no problems. In this case, she folds almost immediately, and it's really confusing. There are other instances of this happening in this case as well, but this is definitely the worst offense. I wouldn't say that breaks the case though, it's still serviceable as the first case of the game, just not in a chronological sense. And just like that, we've already covered more than half of the cases that Athena is playable for. I can now see why people want her to be the main character in the next mainline game. It's interesting to examine the parallels between the first case of the first Great Ace Attorney game and the first case of the second Great Ace Attorney game. In retrospect, I might have been a bit too harsh on the adventure of The Great Departure. It had a lot of grunt work to set up the main storyline of The Great Ace Attorney games, and while it succeeded in doing so, it suffered as a result, being an insanely long slog of an introduction case to dredge through in my opinion. I'd like to think that if it didn't have to do all that setup, it could have been just as good as the adventure of the Blossoming Attorney, the first case of the second game. For starters, this case has an amazing opening, with the reveal that the killer from the first case of the previous game is actually the victim of this case. That right there already had me interested in this case. This is also the only case where you get to play as Susato, pretending to be a male, so that she can defend her friend, who is the defendant in this case, and it's really cool to see her from this new perspective. She's normally very calm and informative as the legal assistant for Naruhodo, but when she's the one in the spotlight, she's just as likely to flub up. And while this case isn't much shorter than the first case of its predecessor, it absolutely feels shorter thanks to less explanations and fluff and a more streamlined story. Also, I really like the culprit. Not a lot else to say on that, I just like how energetic he is and his theme is really good. There are other things that I like about this case, but it's not perfect. The defendant in this case has so little impact on the rest of the game that I honestly forgot her name was Ray Membami, which is ironic. For such a forgettable character, it only makes sense that she takes up so much real estate on the box art. But I think the main thing here is the missed potential with Susato's character. They made such a big deal of her coming back at the end of the first game, only for us to not really get an idea of what went on when she got back. We're kind of just thrust into this case, and then she heads right back to England. I kind of wish we got more of an idea of what went down with Susato in Japan. It just feels like wasted potential. Besides that though, it's a serviceable first case and a very big improvement over the first case of the first Great Ace Attorney game. That's not the only thing the sequel does better than the first game, but uh, we'll get there in due time. I, um... I actually don't have much else to say about the Leighton vs. Wright game. Um... The witch trials are a really cool idea that was squandered by only having two of them. And the fire witch trial isn't that bad, but it's not that good either. It does a good job explaining the mechanics of the witch trials, but at the same time, it's very obvious who did it. So it kind of feels like a waste of time. I also just, I don't like Espella Cantabella at all. And other than the final case, this is probably her at her worst. This case also introduces the prosecutor for this game, Inquisitor Barnum. And, I mean, he's cool I guess, but we barely get to know him. And they just dropped the ball with him for the last case of the game, so I kinda don't really care upon replaying the game. The other witnesses are funny, I guess. Uh, there's this guy whose name is Emir Punchenbog, and I think that's pretty funny, too. And, uh, yeah, that, um, 
that's 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 pretty much all I have to say about the Fire Witch trial. Not not good, not bad. Let let's just move on. Hey, so uh, here's a fun fact. Apparently, the Great Ace Attorney was supposed to be one game instead of two. But because Takumi had so many fleshed out ideas, it was too much to fit into one game. So pretty early on in development, it was decided that the game would be split into two. Knowing that now, it makes a lot more sense that the first game kind of got the short end of the stick. It's not a bad game, like I mentioned, but a lot of what happens in the first game is really just setting up the bigger story that pays off in the second game. So for the most part, the first game doesn't really have any standout cases. This also applies to the penultimate case of the first game, The Adventure of the Clouded Kokoro. There are a few things that I like about this case. For starters, this is actually a pretty lighthearted case in the grand scheme of things. It feels weird calling an accidental stabbing lighthearted, but at least the victim didn't die. I also think that Roly and Patricia's relationship is really wholesome, and Roly tampering with the evidence just so he could take his wife out for dinner, it, that's just so sweet. Apparently, in the fan translation, uh, Patricia is extremely racist, so I'm glad that it's as wholesome as it is in the official release. The problems start rearing their ugly heads when you realize that this is the second to last case of the first game, which does not build up at all into the final case. It's sort of a standalone case, and that doesn't really work in the game's favor when there's only one more case after it. If you look at it as the fourth case out of ten, then it's a bit more forgivable, but again, that depends on how you look at it. And if you didn't know this was supposed to be one game instead of two, I could absolutely understand your disappointment with this case. Other than that, I don't mind Soseki. I know a lot of people don't like him, and while I definitely think he overstays his welcome in this case, I can't say that I don't feel bad for the guy who's basically just had nothing but bad luck in England. We really don't get to deep dive into his problems in this case though, which is another problem as it's saved for a case in the second game. Maybe if the Great Ace Attorney was one big game, this case would rank higher, but as it is, it's a disappointing penultimate case to a game that's more build-up than payoff. Also, fuck Joan Garadib. All my homies hate Joan Garadib. Another Leighton crossover case, this one being the first case of the game, The English Turnabout. It's the only case in this game that feels like a fully-fledged Ace Attorney case, and I already like it because of that. Admittedly, it's an extremely simple case, even by Ace Attorney standards. It also kind of sucks that Payne isn't the prosecutor. Like, I get why, since this takes place in England, but I kind of wish they came up with a convoluted way to make Payne the prosecutor, though Finch is a fine replacement, I guess. Espella is the defendant in this case, too, and I hope you like her, because she's going to be with you the whole game. Oh boy, I don't like her, so you can probably tell how I feel. As someone who doesn't like her, I was obviously elated upon finding this out. And it kind of feels like a cop-out that we never really do find out who the true culprit is. I don't just mean in this case, I mean like they never tell us, period. It's implied that Dark Law knocked the victim out, but it's never mentioned outright, so I guess we'll never know. Though where this case shines is its characters. Johnny smiles as the chocolate-loving security guard who acts as the witness of this case, and he has the whole cool guy facade that really shouldn't be as funny as it is, and this is doubled by the fact that he accidentally solves the case. And Olivia Aldente, the ship's cook and victim in this case, is a really interesting character who I wish we got more out of, as she turns out to be the culprit in a completely unrelated jewel theft, which I honestly think I'd rather have the game be about that. It's kind of criminal that these characters, both design-wise and personality-wise, are wasted on a one-off case of a spin-off crossover, as I would have loved to see much more of them. Maybe in another timeline. So with the 3DS Ace Attorney games, they actually decided to shift things up a bit. They offered a few paid DLC options, including alternate costumes, 
mock trials, and even fully-fledged cases. In the case of Spirit of Justice, they offered us Turnabout Time Traveler, a very fan-service heavy case that is also technically the last case of the mainline franchise as of now. And what a mediocre way to go out. So for Turnabout Time Traveler, the big selling point is that it's supposed to play out like a case from the original trilogy, with Phoenix and Maya defending it, Edgeworth prosecuting, and Larry being there for some reason. On paper, this seems like a pretty good idea for a DLC case, but you know how the old saying goes. You can lead beloved Ace Attorney characters to a courtroom, but you can't make them act like they did in the original trilogy. Classic proverb, I love it. Every one of these returning characters here have been flanderized out the wazoo. There is no more nuance with any of them. Maya just acts like a child, acting really immature, getting in the way of everything, and even fucking up some evidence. Edgeworth is surprisingly really douchey in this case. Like, he acts really cocky and mean, especially to the traumatized defendant, and it's like he's literally incapable of empathy. Larry. Well, okay, Larry is just Larry. I really wasn't expecting much. Hell, even Phoenix seems like he regressed only for this case with his naivety and overall immaturity. And I mean, there are definitely parts of what make these characters great, but they're not the entirety of the characters, and I don't think that the people behind the DLC realize this, because it literally feels like they're playing a completely different game than the game that this DLC is for. And when you do get past how badly they flanderize these classic characters, at that point, it's too late. The story for this case originally involved the defendant believing she had traveled back in time thanks to a pendant that her fiancé had given her. And you really are in the dark for the first half as to what actually happened. It's really fun trying to figure out what exactly happened. But then I did, and I kinda lost interest in this case completely. Which is a shame, because this might be tied with Kidnap Turnabout for one of the most interesting settings in the whole series. I'm normally not like the biggest steampunk guy, but there's something about investigating this blimp that I just think is really damn cool. I also think that the new characters they introduce here are pretty good. You can really tell that Ellen loves Soren, and their relationship is so wholesome. Like, I didn't think I would care about these characters, but I really do. That's why finding out what happened to Soren was so heart-wrenching to me, like it might be one of the most tragic stories in the whole series. And while it's kind of obvious that Pierce is the culprit, and all in all, he's not that great of a character, at the very least, his motive makes sense, and it actually is pretty damn sad what happened to him as well. But I think the big nail in the coffin is that, like I said, as of now, this is the final case of the mainline games. And honestly, I don't think it has enough good for it to be ranked any higher. Ace Attorney 7 can't get here fast enough. Turnabout Corner is a case that has a lot of neat ideas going for it, and it's one that I wish I could rank higher. The idea of solving a bunch of smaller crimes around the city to then solve a bigger murder case is such a cool concept, and for the most part, I think it's executed pretty well. You have to figure out who almost ran Phoenix over, who stole Guy Eldoon's noodle cart, and who stole Trucy's panties. We'll, um, we'll get to that last part to piece together the murder of a corrupt doctor. It's actually really cool solving all these separate cases and seeing how they play into the bigger picture. Everything also just fits together naturally. There's no moment in this case where I was like, okay, that seems like a stretch. A lot of the characters introduced in this case are really fun too. The whole Kataki clan is a spin on the classic mafia family. I know people don't like Walkie and I can see why, but honestly, I don't mind him all that much. Guy Aldoon is a good straight man, and while his twist isn't game-changing or anything, it helped tie together a lot of loose ends. This case also introduces Clavier Gavin, who is honestly one of my favorite prosecutors in the whole series. After three straight games of prosecutors who have a vitriolic hatred towards the defense, it's nice to see just a really cool dude who's down to help out the defense and cares about the truth above all else. Also, he can play a mean air guitar. 
But yeah, I'm at a loss for anything else to say. I, I feel like I just have to give this a 10. Yeah, I'm just really like devastated and just left with nothing else to do. I'm cornered. I'm cornered here and it's just like, yeah. ah! And this case also gives us an introduction to the dynamic between Apollo and Trucy and God damn, they're so fun together. Why did you have to throw her to the sidelines after this game, Capcom? Why? Unfortunately, now comes the part of the entry where I have to get negative. There were a few moments where the case feels like it's dragging on for a bit. The stuff with Phoenix getting run over is just kind of glossed over until the very end. And everything related to it is kind of boring. There are a few characters that I really don't like in this case. Alita, the culprit and Walkie's fiance, might be more forgettable than the girl named Rey Membami. Like there's nothing about her that I can remember. Her design, her personality, her motive, it's all as basic bitch as it can get. Emma Sky Returns, all grown up, but she's basically a completely different character. She's very moody and dismissive because she's a homicide detective instead of working in the forensics department. I'm very glad she was missing from the next game because I do not like her characterization here. And then we get to the big problem I have with this case. The stolen panties plot. See, the joke is that they're not actually panties, they're pantaloons. And Trucy doesn't wear them, she uses them for her magic act. That's not funny. Yeah, I don't, I don't really care if this was a setup to make me feel uncomfortable and that's the joke. There's just something about a part of the case involving a 15 year old's panties that doesn't sit well with me. And it wouldn't be such a big deal if it was like a one off remark, but the panties play such a big part in the murder case that it's kind of hard to ignore. Wesley Stickler, the witness of the murder and the panty theft, has some weird fascination with girls panties. It's so weird. And for some reason, they bring back Director Hottie in this one case for the sole reason of ogling Trucy. And goddamn, this is really fucking uncomfortable. And I just want to move on to the next entry, please, for the love of God. I feel like we need a palate cleanser after the way that last entry ended. So, um... Hey, it's been about 10 entries since we last talked about the first Investigations game. I mean, I think enough time has passed for us to get back to it. I know I've been shit-talking the game a lot for having a story that doesn't really interest me and Edgeworth's involvement feeling unnecessary, but I'd be lying if I said that Turnabout Reminiscence doesn't make me rethink that stance. The case takes place in the past, but like, even before the first Ace Attorney game. We get to play as a young Edgeworth, still under the tutelage and mentorship of Manfred von Karma. In this case, he tackles a crime that recontextualizes everything that's going on in the present of Investigations 1. We finally begin to unravel the mystery of the Yadagarasu, which is ironic given that this takes place in the past, and the more we uncover, the more questions start to pop up. It's also cool to see a bunch of returning characters like Von Karma and the Judge, as well as younger versions of Edgeworth, Franziska, and even a young Kay Faraday, which is technically her first appearance. And she actually plays an important role, since we need to find the culprit responsible for the double homicide of her father and Mac Rell. Okay, come on, that wasn't even clever, guys. And I think that the culprit does a really good job of not only setting up the next case, but also further explains the mystery of the Yadagarasu. That's not even to mention that her plan is so complex, and yet she's able to constantly have the upper hand. It constantly had me on the edge of my seat. I mean, to be fair, it's kind of obvious who the culprit is, but honestly, with Ace Attorney, the enjoyment isn't always from finding out who did the crime, but instead, finding out why they did it and how they pulled it off, and being able to back that with evidence. And I think this is one of the best examples. With that being said, it's even harder for me to ignore the case's falters, albeit this is more of a case of lining up with the game's narrative rather than the fault of the singular case itself. What I mean by that is, for example, Edgeworth's characterization in this case. While it definitely falls in line with how he's portrayed in the rest of the game, it really shouldn't? Remember, this case takes place before even the first game, so he's still working under Manfred von Karma. And in case you didn't know, he was kind of a massive asshole during that time in his life. It was never about finding the truth for him, it was about winning the case. In this case, I mean, there's hints of that, but he's way too nice and patient with almost everyone. 
The bigger problem for me here, and the thing that keeps it from ranking any higher, is the setting. As interesting as it is to see the courtroom in the Investigations games, it really does not make for an interesting locale. You examine the courtroom, the lobby, a hallway, and two defendant lobbies. Everything has this beige yellow color aesthetic, and honestly I wouldn't have been so bored if it wasn't for the fact that the previous three cases had so many colorful locales. I don't normally like to dock points for something like that, but I can't say I didn't notice. On the plus side, you get to question the judge in this case, and I think that's pretty neat. Okay, so like, this next entry is gonna go in a bit of a different direction, and I'm, I'm just gonna ask that you follow me on this one. The third case for Trials and Tribulations, Recipe for Turnabout, it's a real stinker. There's just so much wrong with this case that I don't even know where to begin. For starters, I understand that this game came out in 2004, and as such, it's not shocking for a lot of characters and writing to sort of become dated. But I swear, it feels like they saved almost all of their questionable writing for this specific case. For starters, Gene Armstrong is probably the worst stereotype they've written to date. Apparently, he was already based on a Japanese stereotypical archetype, so that doesn't help his case. He's kind of unnecessary in this case, unlike the other problematic character. Victor Kudo, the old man and witness, isn't anywhere near as bad as Armstrong in the stereotypical department, but he makes up for it by... just... just being a creep. He's creepy. He has a waitress fetish, I guess you could call it? And because of that, he was so busy ogling the waitresses that he didn't even pay attention to the crime scene, which, by the way, let's talk about that now. This is a lot like Turnabout Time Traveler, where the events happen twice, except this time it's even more convoluted. The crime is committed, and then it's set up and played out again so there's a witness that can see the crime taking place, and the blame being placed on the waitress. It's such a long way to go for a plan that makes so little sense. The other characters provide almost nothing to this case, including the culprit's accomplice who apparently just gets off scot-free, I guess, okay, sure. There's other problems I have with this case too, like it can get really confusing as to where you have to go and how you can get there. And a lot of the music in this case is just downright annoying. Nowhere near as bad as Turnabout Big Top, but you don't have to be the biggest turd in the toilet to still be a turd. With all that in mind, it seems like, actually no, it doesn't seem like, I have been very harsh towards this case, and rightfully so, it, it's very bad. So then, why do I have it ranked so high? Well, it really boils down to one thing and one thing only. The culprit, Furio Tigre. I shit you not, this character is probably one of my favorites in Ace Attorney ever. I normally wouldn't forgive a case like this because of just one character, but you guys, you guys. Furio Tigre is it's, it just great, he's great. How do I even begin to explain? The case begins with Furio posing as Phoenix and purposefully doing such a bad job so that the case would be thrown away. Somehow he's able to trick everyone into believing that he really was Phoenix simply due to having the same hairdo and the fact that he wore a cheap knockoff suit and a cardboard badge. Hilarious. And if that wasn't enough, he's one of the most intimidating characters in the entire series. He has one of those uh, tough guy New York accents, razor sharp teeth, a facial scar, is just red because he's angry all the time, I guess, topped off with a gold chain, a cheesy blazer that you can actually wear in Spirit of Justice that's awesome, and some of the sickest animations in the entire series, including one of my favorite breakdowns. He has a scream that lasts eight text boxes, has people cower in fear at his presence, actually manages to reuse the press penalty system from Turnabout Big Top, but in a way that makes sense and is actually enjoyable, threatens to beat up Phoenix because a pigeon pooped on his bike, actually almost kills Phoenix for getting too close to figuring out what happened. You literally only bring him down because you're able to pull the ultimate bluff. I mean, the list goes on and on. He also has a fucking banger of a theme that, fun fact, when I looked it up, 
the channel that uploaded it had removed Phoenix's name from just the title of that one song, whereas his name appears on every other song, which is a fantastic attention to detail. Furio is such an amazing character, and I'm kind of glad that he's like a one and done kind of guy, because they literally perfected his character. I swear, this is the only time I'm going to have a whole character be the reasoning for a placement, but he honestly deserves some kudos after being able to carry the entirety of this case. Without him, it would have been one of the weakest cases in the game, let alone the franchise. With him, it's still not great, but I'll never forget Furio Tigre. It's a damn shame how much they botched him up in the anime, though. Sticking with Trials and Tribulations for a bit, it's kind of insane how well of a job the first case does at setting up what is one of the best stories in basically any video game. A lot of people would say that Turnabout Memories is the best intro case in the series, and I can absolutely see where they're coming from. For starters, in this case, they're actually playing as Mia Fey, Phoenix's dead mentor, in her second trial ever, and her client is... Phoenix? That's right, our best boy Feeny Weenie is accused of a murder he didn't commit, and it's up to us to prove his innocence. This case also reintroduces Martin Grossberg as Mia's mentor, and he's a pretty fun contrast. Mia's great here too, it's so interesting to see this character who we've always known as cool and calm and collected, and a bit stoic, as a nervous wreck. This case also introduces us to Dahlia Hawthorne, who we will definitely talk about more later on, but they do an amazing job portraying her as truly a despicable person with a feeble innocent girl facade. While this isn't her most diabolical appearance, this case does a very good job of showing us how malicious she's willing to be to have her way, to the point where it's very satisfying to convict her, which is not normal for an intro case of all things. Honestly, this is just a really good intro case, but upon replaying it, I do have a few gripes with it, albeit they're very minimal. It's stated a few times throughout the case that this isn't the first time Mia and Dahlia have met in the courtroom, and while the foreshadowing works very well here, and they don't give away too much for a future case, I kind of wish they went a bit more in depth with this. Like aside from a few lines between the two, you really wouldn't think that these two have met before. Same thing goes for the poisoning crime in the courtroom months prior to this case. Again, it's mentioned just enough to not give too much away, but I wish they just went the extra mile here with explaining it just a bit more, because it doesn't seem like Mia has a personal gripe against it in this case, when in actuality, she really should. That's a big thing too, I honestly probably wouldn't say this for any other case, but I just wish it was a bit longer. I know that no intro case has investigations, but I kinda wish that this one did, especially if it's like a pathetically short one, just to give us a bit more setup. I also think that they take Phoenix's character a little too far here. I get what they're trying to do, showing off just how bad of a person Dahlia is, getting these men to go out with her just to basically worship her, and even put themselves in harm's way to protect her, but I really think they could have been just as effective if they toned it back just a bit. The Phoenix we see here is really immature, and it's kind of surprising given that this isn't that far off chronologically from Phoenix's first case as a defense attorney. I don't know, it just seems like a bit too much of an extreme, but like I said, I get why they did it. Other than that though, this is one of the best intro cases, just not one of the best cases in general. Turnabout Samurai is another one of those cases that doesn't really have a lot going for it. The pacing can really slog, especially in the investigation sections. Like, I know that the first Ace Attorney game had this really fucking weird boner for, for, for extending these cases out for three days, had to be three days, three full days. But especially here in this case in particular, it really did not have to be drawn out for three days in the investigation. It's also very confusing trying to figure out where you need to go, again because of how awkward the map layout is. The characters they introduce here are some of the most unliked in the whole series, whether it be one-offs like the annoying kid Cody or the creepy Salmonella who... I don't know... Um, I don't think I'm very fond of the way he's looking at Maya. 
to mainstays like nobody's favorite character, Wendy Oldbag. That being said, I do think this case gets a lot of undeserved hate. For starters, while I think the middle portion of the case is pretty tedious, albeit I'd say, yeah, no, it's pretty horrendous, the beginning and end are actually paced pretty well and do a good job having me care for the client. Will Powers, by the way, is just one of the nicest clients in the entire series, and I love that he's a recurring character. And for how much I don't like the investigation segments in Turnabout Samurai, we get a good idea of the kind of banter to expect between Phoenix and Maya throughout the trilogy, and it's very enjoyable to say the least. This is also where the ladder versus stepladder debate started, a recurring joke present in almost every game. But the real reason that this is up so high in the ranking is because it introduced us to the world of the Steel Samurai, an in-universe TV franchise about a samurai who fights for the power of good against the evil magistrate. To be honest, when I was playing this game for the first time, I really didn't think much of this. However, it's very clear later on just how big of an impact Steel Samurai has on not only future cases, but the characters we know and love. Obviously, Maya is a huge fan, and it's so cool to see that even when she's all grown up in Spirit of Justice, her fascination with the samurai is still intact and stronger than ever. Maya changed Phoenix's ringtone to the Steel Samurai theme in the first game, a show that Phoenix doesn't even like all that much, and yet he's kept that as his ringtone throughout all the mainline games. We also learn that Edgeworth is a closeted fan of the franchise, something explored in the Investigations games. And this isn't just a TV show, mind you. They expand the Steel Samurai brand constantly throughout the series. In the second game, there's a contest with a bunch of other TV-based samurais. In the first Investigations game, the Steel Samurai is the entertainment at the Embassy. Even in Spirit of Justice, we learn that there's a Karai knockoff called the Plumed Punisher. And unlike the Blue Badger, the franchization of Steel Samurai actually makes sense and adds so much character to these characters and cases. I mean, let's be real. Who would actually go to a police-themed amusement park? Now, did I rank this case this high because of something as inconsequential as an in-universe TV show? You bet your sweet bippy I did. Looking back now, it's kind of crazy that we're almost halfway through this list and I've already knocked out about four out of the five Investigations 1 cases. That's almost as shocking as the fact that given that information, I have yet to talk about a single Investigations 2 case and you can probably see where I'm going from here. The leap in quality from Investigations 1 to 2 is honestly something that I am still shocked by. I've already mentioned that Investigations 1 is one of my least favorite games in this series due to its uninteresting story, poorly written characters, and lack of relevance to Miles Edgeworth. To counter that, we have Investigations 2, which is one of my absolute favorite games of the series. The story is so much more gripping and promising, while also tying in some aspects from Investigations 1 for those that like the game. The characters introduced here are infinitely more tightly written and enjoyable, and the whole premise of the game lies on Miles Edgeworth, who, under the scrutiny of the prosecutor's board and witnessing the corruption within, debates whether he wants to continue fighting crime as a prosecutor or saving people as a defense attorney, and I absolutely adore this. Honestly, you'd be hard pressed to find a bad case in this game, but if you really want to try hard, I could see you making a case for the imprisoned turnabout. Compared to a lot of other cases, this is still a really cool case. The whole thing takes place inside of a prison, where you have to find out who killed the culprit from the previous case. You then experience firsthand how crazy the interior of the prison is, with prisoners being paired up with animals, and giant cells filled with doodads, and hey look, it's the guy from the first case of the first game! Kinda shocked that he's still alive! You're also introduced to a lot of big characters in this case, such as Ray Shields, the defense attorney for Miles' dad's agency and his former assistant, Justine Courtney, a judge and highly ranked member of the Prosecutorial Investigation Committee, and Sebastian DeBest, a self-proclaimed prodigal attorney who really doesn't know any better. And I love them all.
With all that said, it's disappointing how badly the flaws in this case rear their ugly heads. I'd say the biggest sin is that the pacing is just really bad, which is kind of crazy given that except arguably maybe one other case in this game, the other cases have fantastic pacing. You just spend a lot of time chasing dead ends and a red herring that kind of goes on way too long. Like, it's weird how close they are to just going with the guy they have until the true culprit is revealed. There's really a problem with natural flow in this case, and while I love Justine and Sebastian, I'm not a big fan of how they're introduced. Like, yeah, it makes sense given what happened in the previous case that they'd have to intervene, but they're kind of just really unnecessarily nosy and rude here. It lightens up quite a bit later, honestly. I'm also not a fan of Ray's introduction, but in a completely different way. He's bitter towards Miles throughout the case for his choice in profession and how he sort of betrayed his father, and honestly, he kind of has a point there, so it makes sense why he feels this animosity towards him. Problem is, he kind of just up and forgives the guy who he's had negative feelings towards for years now at the end of the case, and I'm just thinking, well, I mean, you could still be a little ticked at him. Like I said, it's still a very cool case, but it's undoubtedly the weakest case in an excellent game. Man, I'm, I'm so glad this one never made it to the US. Great job on that one, Capcom. I'm, I'm really proud of you. In contrast to the intro cases being used to reintroduce the players to the game and start off with a new story, the finale cases are usually where everything is wrapped up in a nice little bow, everything feels like it's paid off very well, and the big baddie of the game is thwarted. It's supposed to feel rewarding to take down this final big challenge with nothing but reasoning and whatever evidence you have on hand. Like, you've just gone through four to five cases of proving your mettle as an attorney, this is usually where your big moment is. The takeaway word here being usually. You'll probably notice a lot more final cases towards the top half of the list, since more often than not, they land their mark and then some but there are a few cases where they sort of just flop in their execution. And the really cool thing about Turnabout Succession is that not only does it flop its execution, but it basically caused a soft reset on the mainline games going forward. Now that's how you know you got a keeper. Turnabout Serenade really cemented my disdain towards Apollo Justice, the, the, the game. But Turnabout Succession is the case where I started to genuinely feel upset as there were sprinkles of really amazing storytelling in this game, just hampered by way too much unnecessary baggage. There's not a lot that I enjoy about this case, but it's not completely devoid of quality. I think it does a pretty good job tying itself back to the first case of the game, both with the story and the true culprit. And I do like the first half of this case, with a painter being poisoned and his recluse daughter being the suspect. It was sad finding out how Phoenix started taking care of Trucy in the first place, basically being abandoned in the courtroom by his client. And while I'm not a huge fan of the Mason system, which I'll be getting into very soon, it's very fun playing as Phoenix pre-debarment. It actually feels like a case from the original trilogy. They even brought Gumshoe back for a cameo. That's where my praise for this case ends, because it's time to talk about the biggest problems with the disappointing finale to this underwhelming game, Oh boy! On a lesser note, I like Christophe Gavin, former mentor of Apollo and brother of Clavier, as the big bad guy of this case. I like how extremely convoluted his plan is, yet at the same time, the steps to execute his plan are explained so well that it makes sense. And his breakdown at the end is one of the best in the entire series, but like, he really didn't earn that breakdown. He doesn't even show up in court until the very end of the last trial for the case. You have one cross-examination with him, and then the trial is over. And that's pretty lame. But considering his motive for all of this, boiled down to him losing a card game and not being chosen to defend someone over Phoenix Wright, that actually kind of lines up. Lame motive, lame execution, everything's lame. And the reason that Kristoff even breaks down in the first place is because the outcome of the trial is actually being decided by a jury instead of the judge, which I guess takes me to my next problem, that being 
the Mason System. It's a game program that showcases exactly what happened seven years prior, when Phoenix was disbarred. We actually go back and forth between then and the present, with current day Phoenix collecting more information and evidence from all those involved in the current case. Where things start to falter is that this is supposed to help the jury decide whether to vote innocent or guilty, but this game program literally makes no sense given that A, you're able to take evidence from the future and present it in the past, which should automatically discredit the Mason system as a deciding factor in this murder trial. B, one of the jurors is literally Apollo's mom, making this a biased choice. And C, this whole thing was orchestrated by Phoenix Wright, someone who was literally disbarred for showing forged evidence and is trying to utilize a system where certain events actually didn't happen as a legitimate way of enforcing the law. And that right there, that's the big problem, not only with this case, but also the game. For a game literally titled Apollo Justice Ace Attorney, Apollo barely does anything in the most important case of the game. Literally everything that he has, all the evidence, all the facts, all the testimony, hell, even the jury's decision, it's all thanks to Phoenix. Apollo doesn't even dish the final blow. Really, it's Clavier and the judge that do that, while Apollo just stands there twiddling his thumbs. Mind you, this is the last case of the game, and yet that feeling of accomplishment for overcoming impossible odds is completely removed from this. I'm only ranking it this high because it's a pretty standard Phoenix Wright case, but it's an absolutely awful Apollo Justice case. Really hope they don't mess up his character more in the future games. Hint, hint, hint. I feel like a broken record with how many times I'm bringing this up, but I've never actually played a latent game before. Maybe if I did, I'd rank the crossover cases higher, but as of now, it mostly feels like the game is really more of a Professor Layton game featuring Phoenix Wright. I don't know, it just feels like he always knows the right answer and has no problems along the way. Unlike Phoenix, who literally has amnesia for like half the game, which you already know how I feel about. Maybe that's why I enjoy the Golden Court so much. Well, not entirely, but a big selling point of the Golden Court is that Layton is out of commission due to him turning to gold. Already the stakes have risen, but if that wasn't enough, Maya is the one in the defendant's chair being accused of turning Leighton into gold, and Luke is so distraught that he actually testifies against Phoenix and Maya. That's really sad given everything that we've been through with him so far, but it doesn't stop there. The true culprit of this crime has a story that feels right at home in a Phoenix Wright game. You know, you know minus the witchcraft. It still falls short compared to a lot of other cases in the series, but this is definitely the highlight of the crossover game. Kinda sad that it didn't get into the top half, but that's just the way the witch burns. Was that joke in good taste? I... I don't know. Speaking of kinda sad, let's talk about the final Ace Attorney Investigations 1 case for this video. Some people might be shocked that I'm placing Turnabout Airlines as the best Investigations 1 case over even Turnabout Reminiscence. But honestly, I think that just boils down to the case being more fun overall. As the name might clue you in, this case takes place almost exclusively on an airplane, which is already a very unique setting that hasn't been replicated in an Ace Attorney game since. This isn't just any plane though, this is like some sort of luxury plane with an elevator and a massive cargo hold and a lounge with a bar and a gift shop for some reason. They even have their own cute mascot, which I mean, getting some Blue Banjo vibes here. Needless to say, the setting here is great. The characters fare pretty well too. Francisca returns in this case, continuing her investigation of an international smuggling ring, and she's a welcome return. We got some great new characters too. Rhoda Tenero is such a good character, and it's a sin she's literally in this case and nothing else. Throughout the case, we get to see sort of a mini arc for this character. She goes from being the first person to accuse Edgeworth for the crime, to siding with him and acting as sort of a one-time assistant for the case, to herself being accused as well, and a sort of role reversal with Edgeworth having to be the only one to defend her. It's not a necessarily long case, but at the same time, it doesn't feel crammed together. 
the pacing is very natural. She also has another mini arc as well, but we'll talk about that soon. There's also Zinc LeBlanc, a bourgeoisie art dealer who is probably one of the more obvious red herrings that the series has had, but it's made up for him by being one of the funniest one-off characters. Him screaming, MY ONE MILLION CENTS, is literally something I think about on a daily basis. And Edgeworth being able to deduce the crime from a slow-mo shot of LeBlanc falling down? I don't know, I just think that this is a solid case with a unique setting and fun characters. That being said, I still definitely have my gripes with it. A few of them are more so gripes with the structure of the game itself, but they're exemplified here. Like, for example, I find it very weird that for three of the five cases in Investigations 1, Edgeworth is either a suspect of the murder or basically bound and unconscious. And the three cases are in a row. And in this case specifically, both of those things happen. This is also more of a problem with the game as a whole, but it's kind of sad that the best case in the game, at least in my opinion, doesn't have Kay Faraday or Shilong Lang, characters that are featured prominently on the box art, but show up for a whopping two whole cases. I'd say the biggest problem with the case as a whole, however, has to be the true culprit. There's actually a good amount I like about Cammy Meal. Her theme is probably one of the most unique in all of Ace Attorney. Sounds like it should be in a kid's cartoon or something. Her tired facade works pretty well, and I don't know why they chose the animation for her getting more serious to be blowing bubbles, but I'm all here for it. The problems I have with her, however, can't really be ignored. It's extremely obvious from the moment she starts playing a more prominent role in the case that she's the culprit. Almost all of her dialogue is, no joke, just accusing Rhoda and trying to throw her under the bus. She's got no other personality except Rhoda guilty. But the big thing is that they really just don't go far enough with Cammy's character. It's revealed that she plays an important role in the smuggling ring, but they barely go into any detail as to what she does or why she does it. She's basically just forgotten about after this case. Compare this to Patricia Rowland, the culprit from the imprisoned turnabout, which, remember, I said was the worst case from Investigations 2 and worse than this case. Given that she plays a pretty important role in the main story of the game, she's utilized outside of her case as well, and is used very thoroughly throughout the remainder of the game, playing a vital role in the finale. Meanwhile, Cammy shows up for this one case and is said to be an important cog in the smuggling ring, and yet we never see her again. That's disappointing to say the least, and I think that's a good way to sum up Investigations 1 as a whole. Disappointing. At the very least, it gave us Investigations 2, so I mean, hey, take the good with the bad. So we're about halfway through this list at the moment, and I just want to say that even before this case, I would say that even though I was harsh on a lot of these cases so far, that shouldn't deter you from trying them for yourself. I'm looking at this in a more critical sense, sprinkled with my own personal bias. So I don't think you should look at this as a definitive ranking. You should definitely play all of these for yourselves, and you'll absolutely have differing opinions on a lot of these cases, and that's a good thing. Everyone has their own preferences, their own quirks, their own turnoffs, so there really is no way to judge something other than experiencing it yourself. I'm saying all of this because I want you to know that you might really enjoy the finale case of Spirit of Justice, but I don't. There is so much to unpack with Turnabout Revolution that honestly, I don't think I can really give it justice <laughs> discussing it in this video, no matter how much time I give it. Let me start by saying this is bar none the longest case in the whole series, coming in at a whopping 12 hours, that's right, half a day, and man, does it drag. So much of this case reuses plot structures from other games in the franchise, except they don't understand what makes them work so well. Like, for example, Maya gets kidnapped again. Oh yeah, Maya's back in this game. We'll talk about that a little later as well. Unlike a much better case later on, there's almost no weight to this reveal at all. Like, almost a passing mention. I mean, it's not that bad, but it definitely feels like it's treated as not a big deal. There's also a reveal that a character is actually being channeled by Maya, and while this moment is absolutely handled much better than the kidnapping thing, it's still a reused plot point that really doesn't hold a candle to the original. 
This is actually a very confusing case in that it's actually two completely different cases in one. Why this wasn't two separate cases, I don't know, but really glad they got Turnabout Storyteller in there. That wasn't an awkward placement at all. The first case actually plays out differently than your standard Ace Attorney case. Instead of a murder case, it's a civil trial for the possession of a spiritual orb. I mean, there is murder involved, but that's nothing new for the Ace Attorney franchise. The real kicker here is that while Apollo is on the defense, the prosecutor is... Phoenix? That's right, Mentor versus Mentee in this epic final battle. Man, I can't wait for them to clash wits and for Apollo to finally prove to Phoenix that he is a worthy lawyer. Wonder what role Athena will play. Phoenix must have a crazy good reason to be prosecuting. I mean, this is all so intense, I can't believe it! I can't wait to play it! Uh... So, I could talk about how Athena is given next to nothing to do in this case, or, you know, I could talk about how Apollo, with no build-up or anything, turns from an insecure lawyer who is able to find the truth because of his belief in his clients, to a literal, unbelievable god of law who cannot be beat and is confident in every scenario he's in, again, just for this single case, or, you know, maybe I could talk about how Phoenix, who has had years and years of experience under his belt at this point, and was able to pull off the most ingenious plan to bring a culprit to justice that took over seven years for him to accomplish, including getting this bard in order to do so, is reduced to someone who is basically forced to play along with the culprit because he didn't have the foresight to think about Maya and is so out of character here that it feels like he was written this way just to make Apollo look even more epic. I mean, yeah, I could talk about all of those things, but that's only one half of the coin. Would you believe me if I said I enjoyed the civil trial case more than what followed? I really don't want to go into too much detail here, because at that point I'd be ranting, and I think I've done enough for this case already. I mean, ignoring Apollo Justice, this is by far the worst final case in the entire mainline series. The final boss is a literal evil cartoon villain, which just completely takes away so much tension. This is supposed to act as a conclusion for the game's prosecutor, Nayuta, and who oh boy, that's a whole other can of worms for a whole different video. Let's just say that I don't think I'd be lambasted if I said he's no doubt the worst prosecutor in Ace Attorney, and it's no contest. The problems from the civil trial rear their ugly heads here too. Athena plays no role, Phoenix's intelligence is basically cut in half, and they made Apollo the main character here, despite the fact that it was Phoenix who spent most of the time in Karine. I just... I really don't like what happened to Apollo's character. They keep trying to add more and more convoluted lore to the point where it's a mess. Not only that, they again keep him as this invincible god of law, who can literally defeat someone who can change the law in a matter of seconds. How is this a real case? So yeah, I really don't like Turnabout Revolution, but at the same time, there are things that I enjoy that keep it from being towards the bottom of the list. In the civil case, I really enjoyed the character of Army Buff, I don't want to even spoil what happens with them, you gotta experience that yourself. And I'm not gonna lie, when they tried to make these moments feel big and epic, I'd be lying if I said they didn't somewhat succeed. And, for whatever reason, the investigation scenes are actually pretty solid. I don't like the story between Dirk and Apollo, but I mean, if we had to stick with it, they chose a good way to handle it here. It's nice to see them bond in different settings and circumstances compared to the other investigation scenes. Other than that though, I mean, I really don't know what else to say. Turnabout Revolution makes the top half, but just barely. This looks to be the last we'll see of Apollo if the mainline games continue, and as much as I hate to admit it, that's probably for the best. Lest we get another backstory about his long lost sister. Wait a second. Well, those last two entries went on for much longer than I was hoping, so I think it's time for another palette cleanser. Remember what I said just before we started counting down, that there might be a surprise. Well, let's talk about the Ace Attorney anime. It's not great. Okay, that that's too harsh. It's true that the animation is 
kind of all over the place and really it just recaps the base points of the cases without going into the heart and emotion behind them, as well as that true aha feeling that you get figuring out the answer to the cases. That being said, there is still a lot to enjoy. There is only one thing on my menu, dick. Gumshoe. Whereas it's not the best at telling the story of the cases, the anime actually does a very good job showing off these characters in settings that were never really explored in these games. Did you know that Phoenix lived in a tiny apartment and rode his bike to work every day? If he only played the games, then probably not. It's, it's just nice seeing these lovable characters in a more chill setting. And while the stories they retold were lackluster, the original stories they came up with for the show add so much character and perspective to these goofballs. It's never anything too crazy in regards to divulging from the story. We'll get like maybe one to two episodes revolved around Pearl reminiscing about Mystic Maya and a shell that holds sentimental value, or some origin stories that were described in the games, but the anime goes into so much more detail as to the importance of said moments. Like I said, nothing really in regards to a fully-fledged case. Except for one instance. Northward Turnabout Express is a case that takes place smack dab in the middle of Season 2, which covers the third Ace Attorney game, and is 100% original to the anime. And I kind of love it? For starters, the whole case takes place on a train that just so happens to have not only Phoenix and Maya on board, but Gumshoe and... The Judge? and they're rooming together, which would imply some sort of relationship between the two, whether that be a friendship or something else. I don't know. I'm not one to judge. That's his job after all. The fact that this whole thing takes place on a train is such a, such a big positive for me. And I do mean everything, including the trial. That's just so good. I know murder mysteries on a train are cliche and tropey, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't love me a good train mystery. And this, this is a really good one. I love how it starts as a retrial from a case from years ago, only to turn into a murder mystery. I love how it escalates in insanity to the point that there's a bomb on the train. I know, like I said, cliche, but it works so well here. Also, in order not to fuck with any of the canon, they introduce a completely new and original prosecutor, Tristan Turnbull, who is just such a good prosecutor. I mean, I don't really want to spoil anything else. I I'm begging any Ace Attorney fans to watch this three episode turnabout. It is absolutely worth your time. I really can't place it any higher because of the special circumstances of this case, but don't let its placement in this video fool you. It is a really good time all around. Okay, back to the games. I might have touched upon this earlier, but the impact of a case on the metagame of this series is something that should definitely be considered when looking over these cases. What I mean by that is how do the ramifications of what happens in this case affect the story and characters outside of the case? How much of an impact do they leave? An example of this would be, as I said, Turnabout Samurai's introduction of the Steel Samurai to the players, which then blossomed into becoming a recurring background character and constant references made throughout almost all of the games. It's funny that I mentioned Turnabout Samurai, because the case right before it probably leaves the biggest impact on the entire mainline game, at least in the sense of what we actually play through. Turnabout Sisters is a massive turning point in the Ace Attorney canon, and it's only the second case of the first game. What happens in this case is that Phoenix's mentor, Mia Fey, gets murdered in the law offices, and her sister, Maya Fey, is the prime suspect. Anyone who's played this game before knows how important the characters of Mia and Maya are in the original trilogy, so playing through the event that led to Phoenix and Maya meeting for the first time in such unfortunate circumstances, it kind of brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? Unfortunately, impact is in everything when it comes to ranking. And while this case's ramifications left a lasting effect on the entire series, the case itself doesn't really live up to the hype of the legacy. Really, I think it boils down to two things in general. First, I think that the villain, Red White, had very good writing in the beginning of the case. He's a larger-than-life CEO who uses big words he probably doesn't even know the meaning of, and he's so rich and important that he's able to basically accuse Phoenix on the spot once Phoenix confronts him. However, the second he gets legitimate pushback from Phoenix in court, 
He folds over, he jumbles his words, says things he's not supposed to, and tries to fake a stomach illness to get him off the witness bench. This is fine, I have no problem with this whatsoever. What I do have a problem with is how we eventually take him down. You basically read off a list of people who he's blackmailed in the past, and for whatever reason that gets him to admit his crimes? Okay? Like, they hint as to what this is, but they don't give a good reason as to why he just gave up. And the other thing, which I think is the much bigger problem in this case, is the introduction of spirit channeling. Now, I know this is a controversial opinion, I just want you to hear me out on this. In the mainline games, one of the gimmicks is that Maya can spirit channel dead people to help out with the cases, though mostly this is just used on her sister Mia to help Phoenix out in court. Personally, I don't really have a problem with this at all. I know this sort of ruins people's suspension of disbelief, but the Ace Attorney series has always been very fucky when it comes to real-world laws, so I mean, I'm not against it. And credit where credit is due, they do a good job tying spirit channeling into law later on. Explaining a case from the past that involved hiring Maya's mom to conjure the victim of a murder. I actually really like that. What I don't like is how it's executed, especially in this case. I don't have a problem with Mia being very handholdy here with Phoenix. I mean, after all, this is his second case ever, and his first case without Mia. Not to mention he's up against Miles Edgeworth, who at the time was seen as this ruthless prosecutor who would do whatever it took to win. Like, if it was me, I'd basically let her take the reins on this one. How she helps, though... Uh, look, I get that Phoenix is a rookie here, so he'll sometimes do something he's not supposed to do, or say something he's not supposed to say, so he'll need guidance in the right direction. That being said, it is absolutely ridiculous that Phoenix needed Mia to tell him he needed to flip over a piece of paper with bloody writing on it that has extremely important information pertaining to the case. Rookie or not, if you're examining evidence and there's some paper, your first instinct should always be to check both sides. I mean, come on! And I think that's the big problem with this case. It has a huge impact on the franchise, but the introduction of new characters and mechanics is just written very sloppily. Luckily, it gets tightened up very quickly, and Mia does get her justice in the end, but we have to wait a few games before we hit that mark. I just realized that we talked about the first case that Maya Fey ever appeared in. I think it's safe to say that Maya is one of the best additions to the franchise. She offers an extremely energetic and bubbly personality to coincide with Nick's more stoic and serious outlook. They really do make a great pair. So when we got around to the second trilogy, people were noticing a severe lack of Maya Fey. There were other characters that were missing too, some of which showed up a bit later, but Maya's absence was arguably the biggest loss to the series. Come Dual Destinies, and we learn some info via a letter that Maya is training to be a master in Karain. So we knew where she was, and some were satisfied, but others were still left with a Maya-shaped hole in their heart. Then, with the announcement of the sixth Ace Attorney game, titled Spirit of Justice, it was announced that Maya would be making her grand return, and that she would reunite with Phoenix once again. It took three cases into the game to actually get to that point, but in the right of turnabout, we finally get the return of Maya Fey. Only for her to be accused of a murder like two minutes later. Yeah, so when they said that Maya was going to make her grand return, they really meant that she was going to be used as a plot device in not one, but two cases, and that we'd barely get to see her or interact with her outside of that. True, we get more of her in the DLC case, but I've already voiced my problems with that one. It really bothers me when companies do this. They, they, they do this thing where they hype up the return of something or someone in an upcoming entry, only for their presence to be greatly over-exaggerated and underutilized. Okay, give my love to Brian and Meg, and hopefully we can come down there for the season finale. No? You're just not gonna be a part of this at all? Okay then, bye Stewie! And that's definitely how it feels with Maya in this game, and in this case. It sucks too, because the small tidbits we do get with her jail free are all very good. She's basically the same Maya we all know and love, just grown up with a bit more maturity. But not a lot. With all that said, I gotta say, I really enjoyed all the non-Maya parts. The story they tell here is pretty gripping, and actually really sad. 
The story of a monk rebel who sacrifices himself to save his wife and unborn child after an incident of self-defense is not the deep story I was expecting to be accompanying LOL WACKY MAYA HIJINKS. I also really enjoy the investigation bits with Rafa. I don't really like her character, but she's very entertaining here. We also learn of the Karain's take on the Steel Samurai, entitled The Plumed Punisher. He even has his own knockoff theme song, which is already great, but it actually plays a major role in deducing what really happened at the altar. I found myself liking this case more than I thought, but the Maya bait and switch was definitely a downer. Like, could we just get five more minutes of her, please? I probably could have said this in the previous entry, but now that I realize where we are, I think we've hit another turning point in this ranking. From here on out, I'm going to try to be a lot more positive when I discuss these remaining 23 cases, since these are some of the best offerings that the Ace Attorney series has to offer. They're not perfect, but a lot of the negatives that I have to say going forward are either nitpicky or trivial in the grand scheme, or they're more of a personal problem that I have with something that might not even have a big effect on the overall case to many people watching this. Are we all good with that? Okay, cool. Whenever I start a new Ace Attorney game, I never expect the intro case to leave a big impact on how I view the rest of the game. Normally, the main objective of said case is to reintroduce the players to the mechanics of the franchise, as well as any new gimmicks the certain game you're playing has to offer. As such, the cases themselves are often tame in comparison to the other cases in the game, nothing more than a simple murder. This rings true for a lot of intro cases, but every so often they're able to surprise you with the severity of an intro case. I already talked about Turnabout Memories and how that introduced us to how awful a person Dahlia Hawthorne is, and that was definitely an important case. However, I don't think the grand scale of an intro case has hit a high quite like Investigation 2's Turnabout Target. The whole case hinges on a presidential assassination attempt that would have caused a whole bunch of treaties and pacts to be null and void, possibly causing another world war. Luckily, the president is fine, but one of his bodyguards is dead, so it's up to Miles Edgeworth to solve the mystery, who in-game they say is the only one who could solve the crime, like he's Batman or something, I love it so much. So yes, you're tasked with figuring out who tried to kill the president, and it's a very fun case. They really nailed down how important this is, not only because the president of Zhang Fa was almost assassinated, but also Edgeworth is breaking so many international laws trying to figure out what exactly happened. Like, for example, examining the president's plane without a proper warrant. And Edgeworth knows about this and defies said laws anyways in order to find the truth, something that bites him in the ass in the next case. Even with all the craziness this case has to offer, it acts as a really good introduction case as well. It gives you ample time to get reacquainted with the overworld controls and the logic mechanic by solving some rudimentary problems. And it shows off the brand new gimmick introduced in Investigations 2, Logic Chess, which took a rather boring by the numbers playstyle from the first game, added some new flair and a timer mechanic, and made it into something very fun to play through. I do have some minor gripes with this case, I mean... Of course I do. There's a picture of the president with a red dot on his head that they all think is a mole, and I'm very curious as to how Miles was their go-to choice if he initially thought that this picture taken a moment before the assassination attempt was anything other than a laser. And the other thing is that this case reintroduces a character from a previous game that we haven't talked about yet, but based on what the character was wearing, Miles should easily have been able to deduce exactly who this character was. Other than those two negligible instances, Turnabout Target proves to be one of the best intro cases this series has to offer, and it's a great introduction to what the rest of the game is like. Just one high point after the other. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Turnabout Academy is a flawless case, because the truth is far from that. I mentioned this earlier, but Dual Destinies loves to ram in this Dark Age of the Law stuff that was hinted at in Apollo Justice. No matter how many times I play the game, I can never take that seriously. Out of all the cases, Turnabout Academy is probably the one that reinforces this the most. 
I can kind of give that a pass though, since the case's investigation takes place on the campus of a law academy, so you can kind of understand why that's being thrown around a lot. I have some other minor gripes with this case, like Clavier Gavin returning for this one case, not even offering any plot relevance, and then just kind of fucks off after that. Maybe it's for the best though, because if I had to look at this 3D Clavier model for another minute, I might go blind. With all that said, I think that the big thing that this case hinges on is the friendship between Juniper Woods, who we were introduced to in the first case of the game, Robin Newman, a hot-headed student who has a passion for art that's studying to be a prosecutor, and Hugh O'Connor, a cool yet intimidating genius who loves archery studying to be a defense attorney. Honestly, these three and the mysteries surrounding them are the biggest draws for the case, at least for me. I know not everyone is on board with the story of these three, but I definitely think that there's something there. Throughout the case, we learn just how much these three have been through and how many obstacles they've had to overcome, all while remaining friends. And with the help of witness testimony, alongside some off-the-record help from a boxy reporter who's also a delight in this case, everything we know about the friends is thrown for a loop. Like how Robin, who up until now has been referred to as a male, was secretly a female in disguise because her parents raised her to be a male, forcing her to wear a training brace to bring out her aggression, and as soon as she takes it off, she flips from extremely masculine to extremely feminine. Not sure how to feel about that one. Or like how Hugh was actually an idiot all this time, failing out of school and taking a seven year break only for him to come back and continue to be an idiot, except his parents were bribing his teacher to change the grade so he passes, all while he continues to lie to Robin and Juniper about his age being seven years older than he claims. Not really sure how to feel about that one, but it's nice to see how in the end, despite all the secrets and doubt, the three stick together as friends, symbolized by their mementos of friendship created by Robin. I think it's a really nice story about friendship that manages to outshine the more messy parts of the story. And hey, Athena actually gets to be the defense attorney this time around for the entirety of the case. That's um, that's good, right? Man, poor Athena. The first great Ace Attorney game is one that leaves you very unfulfilled, but I kind of believe that's part of the design of its cases. The first two cases have you just trying to prove yourself not guilty. The fourth case doesn't really have a murderer or victim, since it was all just a set of happenstances. And the third case... Okay, well, well, we'll talk about the third case a little later. It's not really until the last case of the game where you feel like you actually go through this big story to uncover mysteries that have been plaguing the whole case. And when you finally get that aha moment and figure out how everything falls into place, it feels extremely fulfilling. Kinda? To clarify, the adventure of the unspeakable story ties in heavily with the third case of the game. So a lot of the characters and plot points show up again and get their own conclusions, and each one of them has a pretty satisfying payoff. We learn exactly what happened with the omnibus after the trial and who is responsible. Gina even makes an appearance, this time as the suspect. She goes through this whole character arc through the case, and while honestly I wasn't a biggest fan of her in the third case, she really warmed up to me, and it was great seeing her with the rest of the main cast getting along together. Ashley Graydon seems forgettable at first, but the more you learn about his upbringing and how he got caught up in McGilded schemes, the more he becomes an extremely interesting and memorable culprit. And do I even need to say anything about the Skulkin brothers? They're literally perfection incarnate. Even Ryunosuke feels more adept and confident than the beginning of the game, and it's great to see such a natural character progression play out. This definitely feels like the fulfilling end to a fully-fledged game. Except it's not. See, what happens after this trial, with the contents of the metal disc and Susato having to go back to Japan, sort of makes it feel a bit... half-baked. And when you realize that this game and its sequel are already just one really long game, the pacing problems of the first game, and even this case, start to make a lot more sense. In a vacuum, this case is one of the more tightly wound cases in the whole franchise, and every beat plays out near perfectly, given a few minor pacing problems in the end. But when you see this as a case that is no longer the final case of the first game, but instead the halfway point of this epic adventure, 
the problems start to show up more and more. And while it's fulfilling to beat this case, knowing that, in the grand scheme of things, this case doesn't really have any effect to the overarching story of the Great Ace Attorney, well, that's a bit unfulfilling. But again, looking at this case on its own, it's one of the better cases that the franchise has, so it definitely has that going for it. Give us a spin-off game with the Skulkin Brothers and we might just have a top contender on our hands. Kay Faraday was a great character introduced in the Ace Attorney Investigation spin-off games, but unfortunately, her relevance in the second game is sort of non-existent for the majority of it. She mostly plays off Edgeworth and Gumshoe and offers a bit of comic relief here and there. Unfortunately, she doesn't really offer any importance to Edgeworth's story in the second game. Luckily, however, we do get a K-focused case with the Forgotten Turnabout, which revolves around a murder at the Prosecutorial Investigation Committee's headquarters, and K having a near-death experience, causing her to lose her memory, huh? I've already made my stance clear that I don't really like amnesiac plots in any sense of the word, but I'm not gonna lie, they kind of pull it off here pretty well. When you first see Kay after her experience, she's all bandaged up and in her hospital garb, and she seems very unlike herself, seeming so quiet and tense, whereas we've normally seen her so eccentric and full of spirit. Not only that, but because of where she was found and her lack of recollection as to who she is and what happened the night of the murder, she's the prime suspect in this murder case. She has to deal with all of this while Edgeworth and Gumshoe have to keep her together and keep her from going full-blown amnesiac. Speaking of Edgeworth, this is the case where he really begins to question his path as a prosecutor. He's been constantly loomed over by Justine Courtney and Sebastian DeBest, who have been non-stop threatening to revoke his prosecutor's badge for the entirety of the game. It isn't until the introduction of Blaze the Best, the chairman of the PIC, and father of Sebastian, is introduced as yet another thorn in Edgeworth's side, and demands that Kay be arrested immediately despite many loose ends, that's when he finally snaps, and basically willingly hands over his prosecutor's badge, forfeiting the title of something he held so near and dear to his heart. There's some other really fantastic stuff this case has to offer as well. We finally get the jumpstart needed for Justine and Sebastian's story arcs to make them more than just unlikable pricks. The whole case takes place in this massive skyscraper that has really beautiful artwork when you get to the roof. There's the returning character of Lotta Hart who actually contributes really important information for not only this case, but the next case as well. I just think this is a really well put together case. The only thing that I do have a bit of a problem with, at least in regards to this case, is I don't particularly care for Blaze the Best. There's a lot that I do like with him. I think his appearance is really foreboding, the fact that he cries so much that he has to clear his goggles every so often, and his attachment to his lighter that he waves around, hence the name Blaze. I also really like the way he talks to and about his son, basically just putting him down at every chance he gets calling him a hopeless loser who basically won't accomplish anything in life and will always be a failure. And the way Sebastian continues to stand by his dad through all of this, up until he's outed as the true culprit, it's just so heartbreaking. But honestly, other than that, he's kind of boring. Like he doesn't really pose as any more of a threat or obstacle than Justine Courtney did, and he's kind of just used to reiterate the points that she makes. He gets a lot better in the next case, but we'll get to that soon enough. So there's this subset of cases in the Ace Attorney series that are very hard to describe. Just to give you an idea, almost every single Ace Attorney game follows this five case structure with the final case being this big final act to the plot of the game. And the remaining four maybe have some relevance, whether that be through a character or a plotline playing out in the background. But for the most part, they're sort of just their own enclosed cases. That's not really the case all the time, as every so often there will be a game that utilizes its fourth case as a sort of prelude to the final case of the game. As such, these cases will, more often than not, not really have a decisive conclusion, as it will spill over into the next case. 
The Forgotten Turnabout sort of falls into this group, since you're investigating many of the same areas in the final case of the game, but it manages to stick out thanks to having a completely different story involved in each case. The same can't really be said for the Cosmic Turnabout. Now on its own, the Cosmic Turnabout is a really fun and enjoyable case. You're tasked with finding the culprit of an astronaut's murder while clearing another astronaut's name. To do so, you have to investigate a big futuristic space station that's not only a really cool set piece after three admittedly dull locations, but it also holds some importance to both Athena and Apollo, with Athena practically being raised on the space station since her mother worked there constantly, and Apollo because... Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. We also have some fun characters that we're introduced to, including Solomon Starbuck, the astronaut we're defending, who's basically just given in at that point. We're also introduced to two robots who are very cute and helpful in giving us the information we need, and we're also introduced to their creator, Aura Blackwell, who is the older sister of Simon Blackwell, who believes that her brother was unjustly imprisoned all those years ago. And my personal favorite would have to be Yuri Cosmos, the director of the Space Center who is very full of himself and loves flaunting his badges. Throughout the case, we're constantly tearing him down, and we're actually sort of painting him out to be the true culprit, despite that not being the case at all. You kind of have to feel bad for the guy, I mean, he really just lost all his credibility despite not being the one at fault here, and we're the ones that made him lose that. There are a few problems I do have with this case. The timeline for this case is really strange, as is the whole game. The first day of the first trial and investigation takes place before the first case, and the second day of the trial takes place after the first case. It's confusing when you take a lot of things into account, but it's not that bad. What is worse, but still not that bad, is the fact that Apollo's character takes a complete 180 in this case thanks to the fact that the victim is, apparently, one of Apollo's closest friends. Despite the fact that we have never heard of him before this case. The ever-changing backstory of Apollo is a problem that the latter two games have, but it's much more egregious in Spirit of Justice, so again, not a deal breaker here. The big thing is, which I had mentioned earlier, that this whole case is basically just a first half of a much bigger case that is concluded in the final case of the game. The cosmic turnabout ends with Solomon being found innocent, but then Athena's fingerprints are found on the murder weapon, so now she's going to face trial. I don't have a problem with this, it ends on a pretty strong note, and on its own, the case is still really fun with minute problems, but when you take into account the fact that this is just one half of a bigger picture, there's really no way I can place it any higher. Speaking of cases that are one half of the whole shebang... Similar to the Cosmic Turnabout from Dual Destinies, Twisted Karma and His Last Bow from The Great Ace Attorney 2 is really there to set up the final case of the game. There are a few things that separate it structurally from Dual Destinies case though, that I think are actually beneficial to the story. For starters, it definitely helps that the victim of this case holds a lot of weight to every single character we've interacted with in this game, unlike some newly introduced guy who we're told is important just because. This time, however, the lovable yet gruff detective, Tobias Gregson, met his end, and it's a very somber moment, especially for Gina, who was cleaning up her act and working under Tobias, with him planning on actually taking her away from London before everything went down. It's extremely gut-wrenching to see Gina in this scared and upset state, but what's even more shocking is the defendant for this case. I haven't really mentioned Van Seeks up until this point, and I'll go into a bit more detail later on when we talk about another case, but seeing Van Zeeks in this position, when he was constantly taunting Ryunosuke and seemingly always having the upper hand in every single trial, it is a very weird turnaround when he begrudgingly allows you to defend him, especially given his very outward hatred of Japanese people, which is a topic we'll discuss later. There's some very weird pacing stuff here and there, like I'd be lying if I said I cared at all about the Vigil Daily gossip stuff that injects itself into the case, 
but I'm not going to pretend that it isn't important to answering the question as to what happened to Gregson, as well as one of the biggest mysteries surrounding the two games up to this point. It also introduces the Red-Headed League, tying itself once again to classic Sherlock Holmes stories, something else that these games love to do. There's more aspects worth mentioning as well, but honestly, a lot of it is better off being mentioned when we talk about the companion case later on in the list. All in all though, Twisted Karma is a really solid standalone case, but a much better first part to the bigger story that's concluded in the next case. And now we move on to the final of the fourth cases that are really a bigger part of the next case with Turnabout Beginnings. Okay, well that's not entirely the case. Technically, the reason that we're going through this case is because Phoenix is studying up an old case file of Mia's in a hospital bed, which uh, is something that will become more clear in the next case as to why he's there. So if you want to get technical, the case takes place during the events of the final case of the game, but in reality, this case takes place six years in the past, where we're once again playing as Mia Fey for the second and last time. Our first case in this game sees her tackle her second case, with her mentioning how traumatized her first case left her. And now we get to see exactly how that first case played out. And boy, let me tell you, there aren't many times that I've wept a tear in this series, but god damn was I weeping like a baby by the end of this one. Everything is just so perfectly constructed to be this short, simple case that manages to tug at the heartstrings. The more you play, the more you realize that there really is no innocent party in this entire case, not even Mia, who understandably forced her client into a tough position to basically come to terms with what happened on the night of the murder. The story goes that your defendant, Terry Falls, was originally arrested for the murder of a woman on a bridge by pushing her off. Her sister was there to witness the entire ordeal, and she just happened to be a police officer, so he was placed under arrest. He was able to escape prison before his execution date, and contacted the police officer to meet him at the bridge to settle things once and for all, and then we got a dead body in a trunk, and a man on death row being convicted of another murder. But we all know that the story isn't as clear as that, and it's up to Mia to clear his name. This case also has its own sets of twists and turns as well. You're introduced to Diego Armando, Mia's legal partner, who I mean... I've never met this man before in my life. When I first played through this, I was a little peeved at the fact that they basically gave Godot's identity away with no fanfare to the players, but I came to realize that it made a lot more sense looking back on the first case of the game, and while it was a reveal of who he was, we don't yet understand his comeback as Godot or what caused this burning hatred for Phoenix. The prosecutor for this case is none other than Miles Edgeworth on his first ever case, bringing that full pre-justice for all cockiness with him, and he is a delight. It's a very fun back and forth between Edgeworth and Mia that I wish we got more of. I'd have to say though, the biggest reveal is that the witness for this case is none other than the motherfucker herself, Dahlia Hawthorne, donning the name Melissa Foster to keep her name off the record, since the victim in this crime is her sister, and she needed her identity to stay under wraps so that she could testify and have her plan go through. This is an admittedly short case, and it's so tightly packed with twists and turns that still boggle my mind to this day. Towards the end of the trial, after many hardships and having to use every trick you have, you finally seem to have everything going your way, and you're going to get your defendant out of there. But then you remember... Edgeworth has never lost a case up until he met Phoenix. And Dahlia clearly wasn't arrested, seeing as she shows up in Mia's next case. And then you get a pit in your stomach, as everything you just realized comes together. This scene right here broke me, and it continues to break me every time I play it. You have a man here who is basically broken, after being committed for two murders he did not commit, 
scared out of his mind, nobody would give him the time of day or even remotely listen to him until he met Mia. And yet, despite all of that, it was already too late for him. Because Dahlia Hawthorne managed to get to him, and once she has her hands on you, there's no clean way of getting away from her. She was able to manipulate Terry so much, convincing him that they were in a loving relationship just so that she could use and abuse him and throw him to the dogs when the time came. And yet through all of that, he still loved her. It wasn't until Mia finally began to break through that cage that Dahlia had built up around his mind that he began to doubt his love for Dahlia. And that's when what could have happened to Phoenix actually plays out before us. This is a case where only one person wins. It isn't the defendant. It isn't the defense. It isn't even the prosecution. There's only one person who walked away from this with a devilish smile on her face. Turnabout Memories did a good job introducing us to the monster that is Dahlia Hawthorne. But Turnabout Beginnings is the one that truly cements just how low she'll go to get away with a crime and how many people she's willing to bury in the ground if they get in her way. The final case of Trials and Tribulations plays off of this, and we'll get to that, but this is an amazing, tear-inducing way to get us ready for a truly epic finale. And then you realize the age difference between Terry and Dahlia, and you begin to get skeeved out and think, okay, well, maybe he should have been in prison, but uh, let's just, let's leave that be for now. Okay, so we just covered a lot of story-heavy cases in a row, so let's take a step back and look at some filler cases. I know the word filler probably sends a shiver down your spine, and honestly, I can't blame you. There are some pretty awful filler cases in the Ace Attorney series, but honestly, the filler cases also provide some of the best one-off stories that the series has to offer. Whether that be due to having fun new characters introduced to the story that really make a mark, or in the case of the magical turnabout, take a well-established and well-liked character and flesh them out even further. The case revolves around Prucy Wright, which is kind of shocking given that after Apollo Justice, the game, not the character, she had taken a huge backseat role for the following two mainline games, which is extremely upsetting given how great she was in her breakout role. But here, we get Trucy in spades, and it is a welcome change of pace. Since Apollo Justice, the, the game, not the character, am I gonna say that every time? She's been performing her magical shows to make ends meet for the Right Anything Agency, and they've actually become so popular that one of her shows ends up almost being televised. But things go awry when a trick during a rehearsal leads to the death of Mr. Roos, an ex-member and one of the last surviving members of the troupe Grammarai, who was assisting Trucy with her show and acted as the onstage villain. And unfortunately for a favorite magical girl, it looks like she's the prime suspect. Admittedly, Trucy does spend a lot of her time in this case behind bars or in the witness stand, but because of this, we see a lot of sides to her unfold that weren't really present in the Apollo Justice game. This girl, who we've come to know as an extremely confident and intelligent young woman with an undying love for magic, begins to doubt herself and her abilities when she's accused, thinking that she actually did mess up the trick, resulting in involuntary manslaughter. She's in an extremely vulnerable state, and it takes a lot from Apollo to actually have her admit this, but when Apollo believes her innocence and Trucy cries and thanks him, I'm not gonna lie, it got to me. We also get a lot more story based on the troop Grammarai, a magical troop that Trucy's relatives were a part of before disbanding due to... Well, let's just say a lot of reasons. Uh, it was a very heavy focus in the Apollo Justice game. Here we learn more of the group, including an ex-member who was not actually part of the family, named Mr. Roos, who was kicked out for being a hazard to himself and the group after a fire trick goes wrong and he injures himself. The mystery surrounding him, as well as more info about the troop that doesn't exactly paint them in the best light, really makes this case shine. We also get some fun new characters introduced here too, including Bonnie the Bunny Girl, who acts as Trucy's magical assistant who has her own teleportation trick that in itself is such a fun twist that I don't dare spoil it. 
and Roger Rettens, a TV producer looking for blood from Trucy and Apollo after the accident, and basically seizing all of their assets if Trucy is found guilty. There's a reveal with him as well that's a lot of fun, and it shines a lot of light on some darker suspicions of the troop Grammarai. The setting here is great too, I mean everything about this is great. I love being able to investigate a magic stage set and the underbelly and rafters. It makes this single location feel a lot bigger and more fleshed out. And uh, I, I'm not, this isn't in the script, but I just realized this while I was recording. Uh, there's this really cool like connection between how the magic stage is like all pretty and show offy and full of pizzazz and whatnot, and how the underbelly and the rafters are all shady and gross and disgusting. And you know, like there's a connection between that and everything that goes on with the troop Grammarai, and I just realized that. Uh, so this, I'm improving this part right now. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna go back to the script now. And unlike Turnabout Storyteller, which in a vacuum isn't a bad case, the magical Turnabout is able to flow with the story of Spirit of Justice in perfect harmony. Being able to be seen as a one-off case that is really fun and explores the character of Trucy and her origins and future, and weave into the overall story of Spirit of Justice, with Phoenix being gone from this case due to going to Karine to help out Maya, and the introduction to this game's prosecutor, Nayuta Sadmadi, who... Nope, I still don't like him. There are a few minor gripes I have with this case, but honestly, they really don't hold a candle to what is the best case in Spirit of Justice, which, um, which just saying that makes me realize how sad that is. Wow. This one might come as a surprise to a lot of people, but I actually really enjoyed the Memoirs of the Clouded Kokoro from The Great Ace Attorney 2. Its placement in the timeline is a little weird though, like it's the second case of the game, but it's actually a flashback case that takes place almost immediately after the fourth case of the first Great Ace Attorney game, but before the fifth case. We're once again defending Soseki Natsumi, as he's pinned as the primary suspect in a poisoning case, right after we just cleared his name from stabbing Olive Green in the fourth case of the first game. It's a bit confusing. Though I will say it helps that the adventure of the Clouded Kokoro introduced Soseki to us and we sort of got used to his mannerisms, because while I didn't particularly mind him in said case, there is definitely an argument for him being a bit overbearing. Luckily, in Memoirs of the Clouded Kokoro, not only is his overbearing nature scaled back a bit, but a lot more about him and his personality comes to light. And you can't help but feel bad for this guy who's literally just constantly in the wrong place at the wrong time. It does feel good that once you get the innocent verdict once again, the guy sails away back to Japan to escape his bad luck and report his findings. Memoirs also brings back Olive Green, who was the victim of the Connected case in the first game, and she actually plays a pretty important role in this case. Her motives make a lot of sense, and she actually does a good job playing the part of a sympathetic culprit. There are some other minor characters who are introduced in this case as well who bring a lot of charm with them, like Adron B. Meterman, a meter man for a gas company who was sent to spy on the victim of this case to see if he's stealing any gas. And I mean... Come on, it looks like he's ripped out of a Popeye cartoon, and I love it! But of course, the main star this time around is none other than the victim of this case, William Shamspear. Alongside Adron, he's sort of casually introduced in the fourth case of the first game, although we have no idea who he is and what he's up to. It wasn't until this case we know exactly how much of a character this guy is. Being a devout Shakespeare fan, Shamspear dresses up in an extremely gouty outfit that just fits alongside something Shakespeare would wear, and almost all of his dialogue is either quoting Shakespeare or talking with a sort of ye olden times soliloquy speech. Even in times of distress, he still stays in character, like it's only when he's extremely caught off guard that he breaks, which only happens like once or twice in this game. Honestly, he's probably one of the funniest characters in the series, and if you did not laugh at him rising from the dead, I, I don't know what that says about your sense of humor, I'm sorry. <gasps> I do wish this case sort of played out after the fourth case of the first game, like actually, and not just like a flashback, and it wasn't shoehorned into the story of the second game, 
as the only relevance it has to the story is the very end of the case, and I just think it would have flowed better with the general narrative. But again, that's more of a problem with having two games instead of one, and on its own, The Memoirs of the Clouded Kokoro is just a really enjoyable side piece that gets a lot of laughs out of me. And sometimes, that's all you need. The first great Ace Attorney game is a game that I love, but it has a lot of pacing problems. Just to give you an idea of what I mean, it isn't until the fourth case where we actually get the full investigation trial side by side that we usually get in the franchise by the second case of most games. The second case of this game is entirely an investigation and I've already voiced my complaints about that case. Meanwhile, the first and third case of this game are exclusively trials, which is better than the alternative. However, the first case fumbles for having extremely slow and drawn out pacing, bloated witness testimonies, and the need to introduce players to every new mechanic to draw the case out to the four hour mark. You'd think that the third case of the game would run into a similar problem, as this is your first case in Britain, and your first time utilizing the jury system, needing to convince people to go with a not guilty verdict. And in some ways, the adventure of the runaway room does fall into those same traps. But once all of that is explained away, what we're left with is probably one of the most riveting stories that the Ace Attorney franchise has ever dealt with. First off, you're basically shoved into this case as soon as you step off the boat from Japan, giving you little to no time to get acquainted with the case, the defendant, the prosecutor, really anything. I was skeptical at first, thinking that this was just going to be a by-the-books case, so the feeling of rushing into it didn't really make me feel a lot better about the game's pacing. But once we start getting into the real meat and potatoes of this case, the rush nature of this truly does add to the experience. And it's all thanks to the defendant of this trial, Magnus McGilded. You have to realize that this isn't only our second time in court defending someone in this game, but this is also Naruhodo and Susato's first time defending a client ever, and in a country that they're honestly not prepared for. And their client is someone who has an extremely well-known reputation in London as a wealthy philanthropist who helps out wherever he can. We're supposed to always believe that the client is innocent, and based on his background and what little we know about him at the time, it seems like everything is going to work out for you. But there's something about McGilded that just doesn't sit right. The way he talks, the way he views people, the way he's just so confident in everything, and the fact that he seems so nonchalant about this whole endeavor, it does leave an inkling of doubt in your mind, but, but there's no way he could have done it, right? Well, the trial starts and everything seems to be going well. Beric Van Zeeks, the prosecutor for this case, who has his own reputation as the Reaper of the Bailey, due to the non-guilty parties of cases he's on finding their tragic ends, is also introduced here. And again, I want to hold off on him a bit more until we get to some future cases, but just know that him being here is a big deal, as he's all but retired from prosecution, and he came out of retirement just for this case. Needless to say, though, he's doing a really good job of convincing the jury that this beloved philanthropist really did commit the murder in the omnibus, and to be perfectly honest, he's doing a good job convincing me too, what is going on? There's points in this case where we try to pin the blame on the witnesses, who were also there on the omnibus the night of the murder, but we do have some interesting pieces of evidence that tie the witnesses to the defendant and the victim, but Van Zeeks is able to cut any possibility of their involvement to shreds. It really is looking like McGilded might be the guilty party, and the jury sure thinks this. However, things take a turn when the scene of the murder itself, the omnibus, is added as evidence, and we're able to thoroughly investigate it. In a way, this acts as its own investigation phase, since we're allowed to look all around the 3D model, and the fact that the actual untampered murder scene is able to be introduced as evidence is such a cool idea that they never brought back. Everything seems to check out with what everyone is saying they witnessed, so you go back to your trial. At some point, however, the courtroom is filled with smoke, and everyone has to evacuate. Once we reconvene, we're introduced to another witness who was there that night, 
Gina Lestrade, who we come to know and love later on. And there's blood, not only on the inner frame of the skylight, but also a pool of blood on the ground of the omnibus from where the body would have landed. Well, there you go! The case is solved, and McGilded is innocent! But then you think back and remember previous times that you've examined the omnibus, and... Well, you don't recall seeing that pool of blood on the ground, or traces of blood in the skylight frame. Then again, this is basically your first case, so you might have missed something upon your investigation. But you wouldn't have missed anything this big, right? I mean, how could the crime scene even be tampered with if it was in this courtroom the whole time? And then, we go back to McGilded. Throughout the whole case, McGilded continues to be calm and confident in his innocence, despite the fact that Naruhodo is a greenhorn, and all the evidence is stacking up against him. He is compliant with providing as much testimony as necessary, and even admitting to a few things that would get him in trouble, but he remains a calm and unopposed force the entire time. But the moment that you bring up the fact that the bloodstain might be fabricated, And then it all clicks. The smoke from before was planned out so the fake evidence could be planted, and the only person who would want said evidence to be planted is the one who's currently on the chopping block, aka one Magnus McGilded. Despite that, there's no way to tell whether or not the blood has always been there, as there's no hard evidence to prove it, and memory recollection is not admissible. Ergo, McGilded has got off scot-free due to a lack of evidence implicating him. And even when the prosecution rests and you state that you believe he could still be guilty, he just stands there and laughs, as you come to realize this was all set up from the very beginning. He played every single person in this courtroom like a fiddle and got away with it, with his good reputation still intact, but he played you most of all. This was your first case, and you're supposed to believe in the defendant and prove their innocence. But all of that is thrown for a loop the moment you set foot in the courtroom for your first real case. McGilded does end up getting his comeuppance in a fire in the omnibus in the courtroom, but honestly, I think it's better that way. He made such a lasting impression that it's a good thing they sort of got rid of him before they could come up with a half-baked reason to bring him back. This case signifies a massive turning point in the Great Ace Attorney games, that nothing is set in stone and everything you thought you knew about the franchise is completely up for debate in these games. The first game doesn't really do a good job keeping that tension up. I kind of wish the case after this one wasn't so... mundane by comparison, but luckily the second game more than makes up for it with its myriad of excellent and nail-biting cases, some of which we'll get to very soon. Needless to say though, The Adventure of the Runaway Room is bar none the best case in the first Great Ace Attorney game, and if you played it, you probably know why. And if you haven't, well, now you do. We discussed the DLC case from Spirit of Justice and how I felt that it was a good attempt at a fan service filled case that fell flat in its execution. It's extremely disappointing, because Dual Destiny's DLC case didn't have to rely on said fan service for it to be one of the best cases in the entire franchise, and that all comes down to the characters and writing. First, we should probably talk about the elephant in the room. Or in this case, the whale on the defense bench. That's right, this time around, your client is a killer whale who is accused of killing the owner of the aquarium that houses her. Honestly, that's not even the weirdest part of this case, just, just follow me on this one. Just the fact that this is allowed at all is hilarious, and the fact that you're able to cross-examine her, it just, it's such a fun case. You're also able to investigate a really massive aquarium where the murder happens, and you've run into a lot of characters that all play off of each other really well. 
Sasha Buckler, the killer whale's handler, is just such a nice person that would do whatever it takes to make sure that Orla and her crew are okay and don't get split up. Dr. Herman Crabb, the vet, acts as a good red herring to the case, but is really no more than a grumpy guy with a heart of gold who just wants to do what's best for the animals. And Marlon Rhymes is just such a fun inclusion to this cast, with his horrible rhymes, and also he just really wants what's best for his crewmates. Oh, and also, this case reintroduces Pearl, who we haven't seen since Trials and Tribulations. I would say this is a bit of fan service, but it actually makes sense as she appears in the previous case, but this case takes place chronologically before the previous case. Yeah, like, that's the one thing I don't like. This is the last case of the game, but in the timeline it takes place between the second and third case, which is honestly when you should play it, because playing the fifth case before you play this case, it's like tonal whiplash with how dark that case is. Not to say this case is completely wholesome fluff, there is some importance to the overall story of the game after all. This is the first case you play as Phoenix after he's reinstated as a defense attorney, so it's a bit of a big deal. Honestly though, what really makes this case great is the excellent characters. You don't spend a crazy amount of time with all of them, but the amount of time that you do spend with them makes you realize just how great they are, as characters and as people as well. Like, these are the kind of people who you honestly don't think could ever murder someone, especially someone as beloved by them as Jack Shipley, the owner. And what's great about the case is that, for once, nobody is at fault. There is a culprit, air quotes, but nobody actually was murdered, as it was just an accident. Even the culprit, air quotes, feels so upset about what happened to Jack, the guilt convinced him that he actually murdered him, whereas in reality, he tried to save the captain. So it's actually really heartwarming to see in the epilogue of the case that the culprit, air quotes, is able to serve his time in jail and get his job back at the aquarium. This is undoubtedly one of the most wholesome and fun cases in the entire franchise, bar none. There's so many other things I could mention as well, like analyzing two different theme songs that are both catchy in their own right and play a significant part in finding out the truth, or the fact that the revisualization, something introduced in Dual Destinies that's supposed to be sort of an aha moment in the finale of the trial, actually caught me off guard. But I'll leave it at this. Remember when I said that defending the Orca wasn't the weirdest thing in this case? Well, let me show you what is undoubtedly the weirdest thing in this case, unedited for your viewing pleasure. He has a testimony titled, The Dissin of Phoenix Wright, that basically speaks for itself. With how strong the first and third are, and for how often they're praised for their tight storytelling and fun gameplay, you can't help but wonder, what happened with Justice For All? This game, man, it's just an enigma. It has arguably two of the worst cases in the entire franchise, but it also manages to have two of the most memorable and engaging cases to this date. For many, I can understand their confusion with me putting Reunion and Turnabout so high on this list, and I totally understand the skepticism. I'll be the first to admit that this case is nowhere near perfect, and there are a few messy parts here and there, and characters I would just, you know, completely white from existence, but honestly, it does so much more right that it makes up for its slight blunders. Reunion and Turnabout solidifies how Ace Attorney cases will play out from here on out, both structurally and story-wise. It introduces important characters, such as Morgan Fay, Maya Fay's aunt who helps out around the spiritual village, Francisca Von Karma, this game's prosecutor and daughter of Manfred Von Karma, and of course, 
the adorable Pearl Fay, Maya's cousin and spirit medium in training. And it introduces us and Phoenix to Karine Village, Maya's home village, and an important set piece for this game and many future games to come. But the most vital thing that Reunion and Turnabout brings to the table, and something that would change Ace Attorney for the better, and sometimes worse, is the Magatama. To give you some background, Maya gives you this Magatama and asks you to give it to Pearl, who says she will know what to do with it. A bit strange, but we'll see how this plays out. You then find Pearl and give her the Magatama, and after a bit of talking with her, she uses her own mystical powers to power it up, allowing you to see people's secrets in their hearts, as Pearl puts it. Okay, it's weird how people keep praising this rock, but whatever, I guess. So you go back to Eeny Meeny, a witness for this case, and question her again, when suddenly... So these are Cyclops. They're invisible chains that only show themselves to those who possess the Magatama, and they indicate that someone's response to your line of questioning may not be 100% true. You then have to figure out what someone is hiding in order to break the lock and reveal the truth. To do that, you need to utilize the evidence you've collected to make them spill the beans. If you don't have the right evidence, you gain a penalty just like you would in court, and you have to leave the conversation to get the right evidence, come back, and start over from the very beginning of the conversation. The more Cyclops the person has, the harder they're trying to keep their secrets safe, the more evidence you need for the truth to come out. Okay, so let's go over why I think the Magatama is the best gimmick introduced to the Ace Attorney games, as well as why this shift to the more paranormal doesn't bother me, and why other gimmicks in future games don't work as well as the Magatama. I think it's important to start out on the fact that these Cyclops only appear in the investigation scenes. For as much as I loved the first game, these investigations were definitely the weakest part, it kind of just boiled down to... Talk to guy. Move to another place. Talk to girl. Move to another place. Talk to boy. Get a thing. Go back to guy. Present thing. Get new information. Go back to girl. Present new information. Go back to boy. Bonk him on the head. Like it's functional, but there's no stakes at all. It kinda was just press A to win, which would be fine if investigations didn't take up so much time of the first game. Oh my god, why did every case need to be needlessly long? With the Magatama, there's the added stakes of gaining a penalty. There's a sense of tension where you need to be 100% sure that you have the right evidence going in because unlike trials, you may be missing something vital and that'll cost you not only a penalty, but you'll also have to redo the whole psych lock phase from the very beginning when you do get the evidence. It's a great way to not make investigations just feel like a bog of bland, mushy mashed potatoes that you have to wade through to get to the prime meat that is the trials. I mean, they're still mashed potatoes, but there's more consistency and flavor, and there's little bits of bacon inside to entice you to enjoy the potatoes. I regret writing this part before I eat dinner. There's another complaint that the Magatama, as well as Reunion and Turnabout, really introduce a lot more paranormal magic to the series, which sort of dilutes the logic and deduction that turned so many players onto the game in the first place. The first game really only dipped its toe into this realm by introducing Maya, who can channel spirits, but the only person she's ever been able to channel in that game is Mia, and it's more so just to help Phoenix in Trials and nothing more. Reunion and Turnabout's introduction of not only the Magatama, but more lore of the Fey family and spirit mediums and the Karain village itself kind of serves as a turning point in the series where a lot of more mystical, magical type stuff is injected into the cases. And again, I get it. I get why people don't like it. But by saying that, you're really doing a disservice to how the Magatama is implemented in this series, and especially in Reunion and Turnabout. Of course, I'm not going to say that the Magatama is realistic in the slightest, because let's face it, it's not. However, while the spectacle and show of the Magatama is very otherworldly, you have to realize that all it's doing, in reality, 
is telling you that someone is hiding a secret. That's all it does. It's up to you to figure out how to make that person divulge that secret. And how do you do that? That's right, good old fashioned logic and deduction that we all love. Only this time with more stakes on the line. See, this is where the balance of the spiritual and logical worlds is perfectly matched. The Magatama is revealing something that could not be uncovered using logic, but you need to utilize your cross-examination skills to realize what the Magatama is trying to tell you. To put it simply, the crazy magic relic is there just so that you could do more exciting logic and deduction, and because of its restraint and allowance to make investigations more exciting, it is an excellent addition to the Ace Attorney mechanics that never leaves Phoenix's side throughout the entire franchise. And again, it's extremely important to point out that you can only utilize the Magatama in investigations. It doesn't work in trials, and that's good because that's where logic and evidence and deductions triumphs over the supernatural like it should. Until it doesn't. Or it does too much. Okay, the Mood Matrix isn't that bad. It's It just seems like an overly complex mechanic that you have to deal with in Dual Destinies and Spirit of Justice. What? I don't know these emotions. The Divination Seance is kinda dumb, but it's only performed in the country where all the spirit media magic originates from, so I guess it can get a pass. Perceive is just fucking stupid. Forget about the fact that Apollo can just notice slight details that are imperceivable to the naked eye thanks to his magic bracelets, which is an entire fucking can of worm store that I'm not opening up for business. Nah, it's the fact that stuff like someone sweating or fidgeting or tightening their grip automatically means they're lying? Oh, your one eye is ever so slightly twitching. You're a horrible liar. And now I just realized that I spent most of this entry talking about the Magatama and not discussing the case that much. I mean, it's still a great case that deserves this placement. Meanie Miney is an excellent and believable sympathetic villain. The twist at the end really caught me off guard in a good way. Kinda wish that we got more of Morgan Fay for how important she is here and later on in the series, but that's my only big gripe. Yeah, Reunion and Turnabout is great, and we love the Magatama in this house. Sometimes you just need to take a step back from the Ace Attorney games and realize that these games are sometimes just a lot of dumb fun. Not every little detail needs to make sense if the general structure and flow of the case is there. It doesn't need to be some dark, foreboding story that unveils so much about the characters and the overarching story of the game. Sometimes it can just be a goofy story with wacky characters doing crazy shenanigans. So long as it's fun, and it's having fun with itself, and it doesn't feel like it's wasting my time, I'm going to love it. And hey, sometimes you just need a goofy feel-good case every once in a while, and the stolen turnabout delivers in spades! I absolutely adore this case, and could go on for days and days singing its praises, but given that I just spent so much time dissecting the mechanics of a rock, I'll give you a quick rundown of everything I love. The new characters they introduce in this case, I love them all. Ron Delight is such a precious little cinnamon roll that you need to defend. He's very meek and soft-spoken, but that could all be a facade, as he's also maybe the world-famous thief, Mask the Mask, and you need to pronounce that correctly. One thing for sure, he absolutely loves his wife Desiree and would do anything for her. Speaking of, Desiree is such a great character. You have like an inkling that she's the culprit for a little bit, but when you realize just how much she loves Ron, that thought leaves your mind immediately. I love the story of how these two first met. It's hilarious, but it also manages to be really heartwarming at the same time. This case also introduces Goodell, this game's prosecutor who has a red-hot hatred for Phoenix Wright and a scalding hot love for coffee. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the ace detective, Luke Atme. You can probably tell what his whole deal is from the name alone. Is my eye big? Yeah. Good. Good. That means progress. This guy, 
Not only does this guy have an excellent design, not only does he have great stage presence, but he has such a galaxy brain scheme that he almost gets away with getting himself acquitted for theft in order to gain an alibi for a murder. It's such an insane concept and yet it kind of makes complete sense in the grand scheme of things. Speaking of, this time around, you're not solving a murder, you're solving a theft. At first, at least. Amy Faye's urn, introduced in the case we just talked about, has been stolen by Mask to Mask, and we need to prove that Ron Delight is not said thief and just a superfan. After only one day of trial, we're able to pin Luke at me as Mask to Mask, making him the thief of the urn. Of course, this is all according to plan, as right when Ron is declared innocent, he is now put on trial for the murder of the CEO of a security company where he used to work, and was present at the time of the murder. I can understand why people wish this was just a theft and not another murder case, but honestly, it gives us Luke Atme's amazing plan, and just for that, I gotta give it props. Last thing I wanna mention, might seem like it's not a big deal and not worth mentioning, but y'all, this case has some music that fucks so hard. even introduces us to Godot's theme, and that is a banger in itself. So yeah, you can probably tell that I am in love with the stolen turnabout, which is why it was so hard for me not to include it in the top 10. But these next 10 are some of the best written, most tightly wound narratives of the entire series that there's no way I could have justified having any of them leave the top 10 just to justify my love for this one filler case. These next 10 cases could honestly all be interchangeable in their ranking, as they all have something that makes them the best of the best in their own unique ways. When you think of Ace Attorney, these are the 10 cases that should come to mind firsthand every time. Or they don't, my opinion doesn't matter all that much. But either way, we're in the home stretch now, so let's dive on, on in to the 10 best Ace Attorney cases ever. The final case of the second great Ace Attorney game had a lot riding on its shoulders. Not only did it have to wrap up everything that was set up in the fourth case of the second game, it also needed to wrap up the story of the second game, as well as the entirety of the great Ace Attorney story, since the games really are just two halves of a whole. And this case is the last case that we, the players, would be playing, since as of writing this, it is the latest Ace Attorney game to be released. Needless to say, there's a lot of pressure to go out with a bang. And luckily, at least in my opinion, the resolve of Ryunosuke Naruhodo delivers on nearly every single front. This case does its best to wrap up every single mystery that the first two games had set up beforehand, and by the end of the case, it's able to deliver on every single twist and turn leading up to it. I know I mentioned in the beginning of this video, which seems like forever ago, that there were going to be some spoilers ahead, but seeing how this is the latest game, and given that us Westerners didn't even get to play this game until last summer, I'm going to leave some plot points as a mystery so that you can experience them for yourself. The resolve of Ryunosuke Naruhodo is actually a continuation of Twisted Karma, so it takes place right where the previous case leaves off with us continuing our defense of Barrack Van Zeeks for the murder of Inspector Gregson. Like I mentioned for the entirety of the game, Barrack has a very strong hatred towards Japanese people. 
even when he exhibits his signs of respect to Naruhodo a few times, this, this hatred is later explained to be because of a murder that happened many years ago, in which his older brother Clint Van Zeeks was murdered by a person under the pseudonym The Professor, a mysterious killer who is later revealed to be Genshin Asogi, the father of our friend who died in the second case of the first game. However, Everything that's revealed in this case completely turns Barrack's worldview upside down, making him question everything that he's fought for, and especially his hatred of Japanese people. Again, don't want to give away too much, but once you play it for yourself, it'll all make sense. I will, however, discuss the culprits for this case, since the moment they're introduced, it's pretty obvious who done it. Seshiro Jigoku, the judge back in Japan, makes his way over to London with Susato's father back in the fourth case for a big forensic science symposium. Him being here is a massive red flag, given how strange he acted in the first case of the second game, but the more that you look into Jigoku and his past visit in London with Mikotoba and Asogi, the more comes to light as to what exactly happened with the judge, and how he fits into the murder of Gregson. It's kinda cool to see a judge on the chopping block for a change, I kinda wish we had more of that in the series. And with that, I do wish he was utilized a bit better. This case is really the only time we get to see him in action, but the little that we do get to see is good enough. The other culprit is Mal Strongheart, the Lord Chief Justice of London, an acting judge on this case. And again, I kind of think this one is super obvious from the start, and I mean, the first time we see him in the third case of the first game. Like, he was doing nothing to hide the fact that he was doing something shifty, but again, Ace Attorney isn't always about finding out who done it, it's about figuring out why and how, and I think it excels here. This case is often compared to another case that we'll discuss soon, in which we take down a massively powerful person in the legal system by connecting the case that we're currently tackling with the case that took place many years ago to find out that they're the true culprit once and for all. I do notice the similarities between the two, and I do think that the other case handles it a lot better for reasons that we'll discuss later, but the resolve of Ryunosuke Naruhodo is able to branch from it in its own unique way. It's able to place us against even more impossible odds, and have us feel even more victorious in the end, and it's all due in part to the great Ace Attorney games having a more closely knit cast of characters. And it really feels well earned for a character like Naruhodo. This character, who's supposed to be an ancestor of Phoenix Wright, who started out having to defend himself, not even wanting to become a defense attorney. We've watched him grow from someone who has no idea what he's doing, to someone who's confident enough to basically take down the entire British government. I know that sounds like a big leap, but based on everything we've seen him do in these past 10 cases, alongside the help of his friends and family along the way, it just feels like a grand payoff. Especially given that he was basically a pawn being used for the longest time for the British government without him even knowing it. And now that we topple said corruption, I don't know, it just feels good. Like I said, I don't think this case is flawless. There's an extremely large MacGuffin in the end involving Herlock Sholmes and a hologram, which I mean, I mean, it could have easily been a radio and it would have had like the same effect without seeming completely out of place for Victorian era Britain. But it also has the best investigation scene in the entirety of the two games, so the point is kind of moot. And again, this case acts as a conclusion to all the characters that we've become so attached to. Susato, Herlock, Iris, Barrack, Gina, Gregson, Mikotoba, and especially Naruhodo. And it does it in such a grandiose yet respectful way that honestly the bad parts don't even bother me. And yet, Despite it being the grand conclusion, this isn't even the best case of the game. Miles Edgeworth in the majority of the Ace Attorney series is a very different character than he was when looking at him solely in the first game. Whereas he acts more as a friendly rival to Phoenix in most of the other games, in the first game, the best way to describe him is... Well, he's a massive dick. Like, he'll purposely withhold information, will do whatever it takes to get the guilty verdict, include possible forged evidence, and acts like he's above everyone else. 
I mean, that last part is still kind of true to this day, but it was a lot worse in the first game. It wasn't until the fourth case of the first game, Turnabout Goodbyes, where we see Edgeworth shift from this caricature to a more well-rounded character. And just in time too, since he's the one on the defense stand now. That's right, Miles Edgeworth is accused of a crime he didn't commit, and it's up to Phoenix and Maya to help prove this former friend innocent. And in order to do that, we need to look to the past once again, to uncover the truth behind the DL6 incident, which involves the death of Miles' father, the disappearance of Maya's mother, and one of the biggest unsolved cases to date. Until Phoenix does his thing and gets to the bottom of it. We learn exactly what happened with Miles that caused him to become so distant from Phoenix, the tragic incident involving his father, and his fear of earthquakes. DL6 isn't a perfect case, but what's so great about it is that everything sort of plays out in a way where there are so many instances where if just one thing had been different, this whole entire case wouldn't have happened. If Miles hadn't thrown the gun, if he hadn't passed out right after, if he didn't hear that scream, there's just so much. But because all this plays out the way it does, it's able to make the culprit of this case look all the more worse. And when it comes to Manfred Von Karma, that's a really, really good thing. Von Karma is the epitome of leave them wanting more. Besides a few flashback cases in the Investigations games, this is his only appearance in the entire franchise, and he makes his presence known. He's basically referred to as this god of prosecution, never losing a case in 40 years. He was also Miles' mentor for a while after his father's death, but that doesn't mean that Von Karma is going to go easy on him. In fact, based on how he performs in this case, it seems like he's going even harder on him than he might usually. Von Karma doesn't have a lot of screen time, but the amount of screen time that he does have shows us just how much of a horrible person that he is. He's this conniving son of a bitch who's able to look like five steps ahead of us, and he always seems to have a trump card. His personality might just boil down to evil, but honestly, after dealing with Edgeworth for the whole game, it's good to see just how much better he is than Von Karma. And now it makes more sense why Edgeworth acted the way he did. And yeah, Von Karma might be the worst person in the entire series. He goes as far as to tase Phoenix and Maya to steal some of their evidence, a scene so significant to Maya that it plays a factor in her deciding to leave Phoenix for a bit to go back to her home village. If that wasn't enough, the whole thing with the DL6 incident, well, it turns out that Von Karma was the one who shot and killed Gregory Edgeworth and fabricated this whole plan to get Miles behind bars, and you know why? Not because Gregory Edgeworth beat him, not because he was even close to beating him. It's because Gregory was able to, just once, point out a flaw in Von Karma's evidence, giving him one penalty. That's it. That's all it took to make him seek out revenge. It's petty, it's completely unnecessary, and yet I love that we have a character that just does this and is able to get away with it for 15 years. This case isn't all dark and broody, it can actually be pretty funny too. Larry Butts, who is actually a part of Phoenix's and Miles' backstory, not only has a pretty funny appearance that doesn't border on annoying just yet, but he also is able to introduce some very important information to the case at hand, as well as solve a mystery from all three of their childhoods. Albeit inadvertently, but that makes it all the more funny. And remember in Turnabout Reclaimed, where you have to defend an orca? Well, that's actually the second case where an animal takes the stand, as in this case, you cross-examine a parrot. And it actually works. And of course, this case spawned the infamous Almost Christmas means it wasn't Christmas line, which is still used to this day, even by the official Twitter account. God, I love this series so much. Like the resolve of Ryonosuke Naruhodo, it's not a perfect case. Yana Yogi is a character that always confuses me with his pretending to be insane thing. Like, I feel bad for what happened to him and how he got involved, but he kind of just never really clicked with me. Lotta Hart was introduced in this case, but as much as I love her presence in the series, this is definitely her at her worst. She kind of has the opposite problem as Larry, where she starts out really annoying and derivative, but gets a lot funnier with each subsequent case and game she's in. And of course, 
Because this is the first game, this trial is dragged out to be three days long, which is very stupid and dumb and bad, and I'm really glad they stopped forcing this in every other game because it just made the pacing atrocious in some areas. This case wasn't nearly as bad in that department as Turnabout Samurai, but it definitely had its moments of just wishing that we had two days instead of three. But again, none of that really matters in the long run, because what we got from Turnabout Goodbyes was an extremely solid finale to the first game, and a very important step for Miles Edgeworth becoming the character that we know and love today. Thank God for that. You know, for a series all about murder, Ace Attorney is pretty tame when it comes to how gruesome it can be. I mean, it's really no Danganronpa. With a T rating, you can get away with some blood and some pretty crazy stuff, but nothing that ever really manages to push the borderlines of what a T rating can get you. But then you look at Dual Destinies, and you notice that it's not rated T. In fact, it's rated M. You're probably thinking, how is this game rated M? It's an Ace Attorney game. So you start playing, and you still don't get it. I mean, this case is about fictional yokai creatures, outer space, fucking school of all places, and then you get to Turnabout for Tomorrow, and it opens with a young Athena in a pool of blood, and okay, yeah, this is starting to make a lot more sense now. The final case of Dual Destinies is unlike any other case in the series, at least how I see it. It's another one of those cases where it sort of starts in the case prior to this one, and is concluded here, but it's able to differentiate itself enough to be a standalone case as well. Athena Sykes is accused of killing Clay Terran from the previous case, as well as her own mother seven years ago in the Hat 1 incident, something that Simon Blackwell had been convicted for all those years ago. And I love how it's explored and dived into, Simon knows that he didn't kill Athena's mother, but at the same time, he believes that Athena was the one that killed her due to how he found her and her mother, and decides to take the fall for Athena, knowing that a child as sheltered as her could never survive behind bars. Meanwhile, Athena started working as a defense attorney, thanks to the help of Phoenix, but also just so she could save Blackwell from prison, because she knows that he is innocent. Already, this is a pretty fucking messed up story with a young girl supposedly killing her mother, but it gets even worse when it's revealed that, due to her childlike naivety, Athena had planned to use the robot disassembly machine on her mother's corpse to fix her. The look in her eyes when she realizes this is all you need to know that the memories have flooded back to her. Of course, this is just one half of the turnabout for tomorrow, as the other half is revealing the identity of the true culprit, named The Phantom, an international spy who can be anyone, anywhere, and is said to show no human emotions. This is a person who is seen as the ultimate face of evil for the entire game, someone cunning enough to have planned out every little step in excruciating detail, and someone who clearly has no sense of justice whatsoever. And yet, the reveal of who exactly the Phantom is, is the exact opposite of what I just said. In Dual Destinies, we're introduced to a new character, Bobby Fulbright, the de facto detective for this game. And he's someone who is all about fighting for justice and the right thing, and displays a wide variety of emotions that seems to be constantly fluctuating. But all of this is just surface level. The fact that he's able to hide the fact that he has no emotions by displaying extreme emotions is such a fun idea, and it's utilized so well with Bobby. I mean, technically this isn't really Bobby Fulbright, since Bobby was killed one year prior, so really we don't know who the actual Phantom is, and even after a nightmare-fueled montage, we still have no idea who he is, and I think that was a very smart choice. But honestly, the best thing about this case is that it just puts an end to the goddamn Dark Age of the Law. Thank God, because that shit is just corny as fuck, and the fact that it's able to just cease with the conviction of one spy just further proves how little thought was put into this. 
But yeah, I love Turnabout for Tomorrow. It's a great end to a game that I honestly think gets a bit too much hate, and I think it deserves the M rating for how brutal and terrifying this case can get. Intentionally or otherwise. As much as I love the resolve of Ryonosuke Naruhodo in The Great Ace Attorney 2, and how well that case wraps up its story set in place for this second game, I would have to say that it doesn't really hold a candle to how the story is set up in the third case of the game, and given how much I praised the last case of the game, that just goes to show how incredible the return of the Great Departed Soul is. The way the case starts makes it seem like it's going to be a self-contained case, and as far as those go, this is actually pretty dang fun. We're defending Albert Harebrain, a scientist from Germany who came to London to exhibit his transportation device for the Great Exhibition. Unfortunately, things go awry, as the machine malfunctions and seemingly kills Udi Asman, who funded the project and even volunteers to test it for the Great Exhibition. Harebrain himself is a very unique client, and I don't mean that just because he's friends with Barrick. He's a man of science first and foremost, so he wants us to prove that his transportation machine worked successfully, and that it wasn't a hoax. However, if we do that, that would just prove that Harebrain is guilty of the crime, something that he's fully aware of, and yet still has that as his top priority and request for Naruhodo over proving his own innocence. In addition, if they do claim that the machine is indeed fake, then all legal acts protecting Hairbrain's work and hypothesis would be void, and the machine would be dismantled to be investigated. It really does put us in a tight spot of whether we respect the client's requests or the client's well-being. In the end, unfortunately, Harebrain is finally convinced that his machine was really just an illusion when he reveals that he hired a third-party engineer to build his machine, someone who is notorious for engineering elusive tricks. You really do feel bad for Harebrain, like there was no way that both him and his invention were getting out of there unscathed, but you can't help but feel bad that the guy who basically spent his whole life figuring this out had it turn out to be a hoax that wasn't even under his control. Of course, this is only one half of the case, as the second half is dedicated to Enoch Dreber, the engineer in question, and introducing us to the professor and his true identity. Enoch might just be my favorite character in the entire Great Ace Attorney series. His design is top tier, his animations are so fun and robotic, and his theme is a bop. But of course, the big thing with Enoch is how important he is to the story of the game and the professor. Like, Drever might be the definition of wrong place at the wrong time, as everything goes wrong for him in just one night. Years prior to the case, Enoch was a very smart and successful college student with a bright future. Unfortunately, he was poor, so he had to make ends meet by grave robbing. One night, while robbing a grave, he saw a body rise from the grave, only to be shot and killed. Traumatized by the event, he told everyone he could, but no one would believe him, until one day he was interviewed by a reporter who went by the name of Odie Asman. Uh... Anyways, because Asman had mentioned that Drebber was grave robbing, he was kicked out of the university, no longer able to pursue science, and only got by with tricks for the trade. If that wasn't enough, it turns out that the person that he saw rise from the grave was none other than the professor, a serial killer who was set to be executed that day. Needless to say, this wasn't the case, and Scotland Yard did whatever they could to deny the story and shut Drebber up, even going so far as to force the waxwork of the professor to wear a metal mask so that his identity would never be revealed. Drebber is probably the best case of a sympathetic villain that the entire series has had to date. He was once a respected scientist, but after that fateful night, nobody would listen to him, despite what happened being the truth. He vowed to get revenge on Asmin and Scotland Yard by killing him and stealing the waxwork of the professor and removing the mask. And like, yeah, he is absolutely insane in his execution, causing harm to multiple people via explosive devices, but you also sort of want to see him succeed in a way? 
The only thing is that in order for him to get his revenge, he unknowingly almost caused the same fate upon Harebrain, an innocent pawn in his scheme. When he realizes what he's almost done, causing the same hardships that he had to endure almost all those years ago against someone who doesn't deserve it, he comes clean with everything that played out. The story of Drebber is honestly a great tale of how revenge can overtake one and truly turn them into something they don't recognize, and it's told with such an air of maturity that works extremely well here. And like I said, this is the case where we're finally introduced to the Professor, an excellent introduction that concludes with a few twists that shape the entirety of the rest of the game. And it also ties into a mysterious new masked character that is introduced in this case as Barrack's Apprentice. He doesn't really play a major role until the second half of the case, and he barely has any lines, but Susato thinks there's something very familiar about him. It's not until the end of the case, when the mask comes off the Professor Waxwork revealing his true identity, that the identity of the masked apprentice comes to light. The waxwork reveals that Genshin Asogi, the father of Naruhoto's dead friend Kazuya, is indeed the killer known as the Professor. However, the twists don't end there, as seeing the true face of the Professor ignites the memories of the masked apprentice, who reveals himself to be none other than Kazuya himself, somehow surviving his supposed death from the boat. In hindsight, Given the name of the case and how Susato reacts to The Apprentice, it's a bit obvious what the twist was going to be from the beginning, but honestly, it's still an important revelation that's necessary to building Kazuya's character for the rest of the game, who continues to be a prosecutor from this point on, even prosecuting on the next two cases in order to clear his dad's name. Honestly, there's a lot more that I could say about this case, but I've already talked an earful about it. This is undoubtedly the peak of the Great Ace Attorney series, and I'm glad that we have a story that's able to tell such a fascinating tale, even after it turns out that the main gimmick behind it turns out to be false. I'm looking at you, Turnabout Time Traveler. The Grand Turnabout is a very fitting name for the last case of the second Ace Attorney Investigations game, because who oh boy, does a lot of shit go down in this case. The beginning focuses on us investigating a movie lot, where a monster movie is being shot, where we find the body of the president of Zhang Fa, who we last saw in the introduction case of this game. We're also officially reintroduced to Shi Long Lang, the Interpol agent from Zhang Fa who played an extremely crucial role in the previous game. It's a little strange to see him just show up here, especially given how important he is to this last case, but at least we get a really interesting story out of it that sort of ties into his arc from the previous game and relates to this game's message of forging your own path. If that wasn't enough, we also have to solve a kidnapping case. John Marsh, the child actor starring in said monster movie, has been kidnapped, and we later learn through a game of logic chess that John is Justine Courtney's adopted son. This is a great bit of characterization for her, as up until the last case, she was... Well, she was kind of a bitch. But now we have to see her juggle her motherly responsibilities with her moral obligation as an unbiased servant of the law, as at the same time as this kidnapping case, she's also trying over Patricia Rowland, the culprit of the imprisoned turnabout. She received a call from the kidnappers just before the trial started, stating that in order to see John again, they demand a not guilty verdict for Roland. Of course, that shouldn't be too hard for her to do because in yet another part of the case, the decisive evidence needed to convict Roland has gone missing, along with Sebastian DeBest, who was supposed to be the acting prosecutor for this case. He ran off in the previous case after learning what his father had done, and hasn't been seen since. The trial can't continue without the evidence, and Courtney will have to declare Roland innocent, so now we also have to find Sebastian and the evidence. This leads us to Blaze the Best Garage, where we find some very helpful clues, as well as a kidnapped and tied up Sebastian. We then have to utilize our logic chest once again to have him reveal that he gave the evidence to Blaze the Best for safekeeping, who probably got rid of or destroyed the evidence. 
We also have to convince him not to follow in the footsteps of his dad and become the best prosecutor on his own. Again, cementing that forging your own path message. Blaze is called up to the stand and we now have to prove the connection between him and Roland. And when it seems like you're unable to do that, Sebastian finally reappears in the courtroom with the evidence needed to put his father, and this case, to rest. This is a great piece of character development for someone who's basically been nothing but a clueless idiot, who basically is forced to step up, and against his father no less. During all of this, Kay and Gumshoe find and return John back to his mom, for what looks to be a happy ending. Until Lang busts through the courtroom doors because Oh yeah, the president's still dead, bet you forgot about that, and Justine Courtney was the last person to speak with him, so now she's the prime suspect. And all of what I just mentioned is only a third of the whole case. I'm not going to go into too much detail with the remaining two-thirds of the case, only because it's more straightforward and contains a massive twist that I really don't want to spoil if only because this game was never officially released in the West, so chances are a lot of people haven't even heard of this game before, let alone played it. Needless to say, while the tension isn't as nail-biting as this first third, it's still as interesting as we learn that behind basically everything that happened in this entire game, there was a single mastermind who planned everything, and it's up to us to deduce the true identity and confront them for the final showdown, and words cannot describe how chaotic this gets. And I love it! I absolutely adore the second Investigations game, and the finale does an amazing job tying literally every single case together in an equally harmonious and anarchic way, something that was attempted in the first game but failed with its execution, at least in my opinion. And yet, despite it being the grand conclusion, this isn't even the best case of the game. I'm gonna get crucified for this one. Okay, so if you just so happen to only play the GBA version of the first Ace Attorney game, then the last case you would have played would have been Turnabout Goodbyes, making this case count equal four. However, the GBA version was Japan only, so the entire original trilogy was Japan exclusive in its early years. However, about a year after the release of the GBA version of Trials and Tribulations, the first Ace Attorney was finally released in the West for the Nintendo DS. The game had been updated to adapt to the DS's new features, including its system selling feature, the dual screens, which allowed the bottom screen to be utilized for things such as the court record, clearing up the top screen even more. Along with that, the DS also featured a built-in microphone, a touch screen, and more powerful hardware that allowed the DS to display 3D graphics. And so, to utilize all these new features, as well as to celebrate the Ace Attorney series release worldwide, a fifth case was added to the first Ace Attorney game. And it is a controversial one. Rise from the Ashes was definitely, for the longest time, the absolutely biggest case in the entire Ace Attorney series, with it being almost 10 hours long. And there are definitely parts where this case feels like it drags. Remember, this is the first Ace Attorney game, so that means it had to abide by the three-day trial rule, which meant that the investigations could feel insanely long and drawn out at times. And this case also has a lot of moments where, even after playing through it three times now, there are times where I have no idea where I'm supposed to go or what I'm supposed to do, and when I figure it out, it isn't an aha moment, it's a finally moment, and that's not good. But you know what is good? Literally everything else about this case. Actually, scratch that, it, it's not good. It's great. Fantastic, even. I can honestly forgive the needlessly long moments in the investigation phase because of how it utilizes its characters and story. Let's start, first, with the improvements made due to the leap in hardware. Rise from the Ashes really wants to let you know that it is unlike any other case you've seen previously, as it loves to flaunt a lot of moving parts and 3D models that really could not be shown on the GBA and they use it in such a minimalist way that it benefits from not looking too outdated, thanks to utilizing silhouettes and black and white footage to showcase said models. 
I mean, it's not perfect, but at the very least, it also knows its own limitations and doesn't try to gallivant them unedited for a full minute and a half using gaudy color choices. You also have a few new gameplay mechanics that are tailor-made for the DS, which adds some unique flair to both the investigations and the trial. The fingerprinting utilizes the mic to blow away the powder, while the luminal spray utilizes the touchscreen to spray for possible bloodstains at the crime scene. Alongside that, you're allowed to fully examine 3D models of evidence in your court record, something that is vital to figuring out the mystery of this case. These are all aspects that were reintroduced in the Apollo Justice game, and they're really fun to utilize here. Okay, actually, that's not true because whoever invented this jar mini game needs to actually reevaluate their priorities because it is the bane of my existence every time and I hate it so much. Oh my god, why is it so precise? Of course, gameplay isn't everything here, as the story of this case plays a major role as well. With Maya going back to her home village to strengthen her spirit medium training, we now have a new assistant to help us out, Emma Skye. She's a wannabe forensic scientist who later does end up getting her dream job in future cases. Nobody could ever replace Maya, but Emma's a great one-off assistant. Her scientific skills actually come very much in handy with the investigation side of this case. And since we're defending her sister Lana, who is also the chief prosecutor, she has a personal stake in this as well. We get a pretty crazy story here, involving a gaggle of detectives, a serial killer, my sleep paralysis demon, and a corruption scandal that goes all the way to the top, with the culprit of this case, District Chief of Police, Damon Gant. What I love about Damon Gant is that it is so obvious that the game is doing nothing to hide the fact that this man is clearly the culprit. Whether that be due to his intimidating stature, foreboding presence, or his own theme music. But the thing is, they don't need to hide the fact that Gant is the culprit because he's so good at what he does. He's able to keep three steps ahead of us and is constantly holding Edgeworth's position on the line just because he can. He's constantly using his power to forge and dispose of evidence, and is very smart when it comes to the law, able to utilize certain tactics that make him almost impossible to cross-examine due to his stature. And yet, he comes across as an extremely friendly guy at first, being friends with the judge and even offering us $50. So it takes everything to figure out what exactly he's up to and take him down. And honestly, that might just be my favorite part. Remember, you do not have access to Maya in this case, and ergo, that equates to Mia as well. As such, this is technically your first case where you're on your own with no outside help from a legal higher-up or mystical powers. This case requires Phoenix, who is still a rookie at this point, to utilize all of his logic and reasoning skills to take down the big bad once and for all. Although, you're not actually entirely alone. Since this takes place after Turnabout Goodbyes, we actually get to see Edgeworth begin his character arc of becoming a better person, and despite us going against him once more in this case, he's fighting for the truth this time around. So whenever he sees that we're onto something, he nudges us to keep going. Towards the end of this case, when we seem to corner Damon Gant, there's this great back and forth with Phoenix and Edgeworth constantly going off on Gant, and this was absolutely the peak of the case for me. And honestly, the peak of the game. You were able to stop this corrupt power, due solely to your logic and reasoning, with almost no outside help whatsoever. I know a lot of people don't like Rise from the Ashes, but not only do I think that the hate is undeserved, I think it's one of the best cases that the first game has to offer. Granted, it was written after the entirety of the original trilogy had already been created, so they had a lot of practice at that point, but that's besides the point. It really is such a shame that Ace Attorney Investigations 2 never officially released in the West because a lot of people missed out on what is arguably the best Ace Attorney game to date. And smack dab in the middle of the game is what could honestly be considered the best case of the entire series the Inherited Turnabout. There's so much going on in this case that there's no way I'm going to be able to cover everything, so let me just start by talking about something that I wouldn't normally like in any other case, that the Inherited Turnabout manages to pull off in spades. 
The entire case basically takes place in a single building with a bunch of rooms that all look very similar to one another. Whereas I've criticized something like the adventure of the Unbreakable Speckled Band for something along those lines, the inherited turnabout is able to pull through by having each room have a unique decoration, with the patio having a large fountain connecting all of the rooms, and the rest of the rooms having some delicious delicacies, such as a candy castle, or sherbet constellations, or even a giant chocolate chip. The entire case is built around the finale of a dessert making competition, so that sort of makes sense, and I am all for this kind of thing. There's also the added bonus of having the case take place at different moments in time, so what we see in one section of gameplay might be completely different from another section of gameplay, but we'll get to that very soon. The new characters here are all at their best. Jeff Masters and Catherine Hall are a father-adopted daughter duo that used to do a really famous cooking dessert show, with Masters being known as the best dessert chef of all time. Unfortunately, 17 years ago, he was convicted of a crime that he did not commit during the finale of his dessert competition, and he's been in prison ever since. We also learn that Catherine has been visiting him every day in prison, which just shows how much she cares for her dad. Catherine has since retired from acting and bought Master's Mansion to open up a museum to show off some of Master's best works, including some of the finalists' desserts. Because of this, all of the living finalists return for the grand opening. Delicia Scones is a very funny character. I honestly thought she was going to get on my nerves, but luckily she's not overused, and she's actually able to provide some pretty useful information for this case from 17 years ago. And Dane Gustavia... Well, let's discuss the story of this beast of a case. As I mentioned before, The Inherited Turnabout is a case that actually takes place during two time periods. In the present, Ray, who has been working with Jeff Masters for 17 years to acquit him, asks for Edgeworth's help to find the true culprit of what has been deemed the IS-7 incident. Because of the grand opening of the museum, all of the suspects have once again returned, which means that it's up to us to find out what really happened 17 years ago. In addition to that, we also get to play through the IS-7 incident that took place 17 years ago to get further context as to what exactly happened. And this is where the case jumps from great to fantastic. Because for these sections, you're no longer playing as Miles Edgeworth, world-famous prosecutor. No, for these parts of the case, you're playing as Gregory Edgeworth, Miles' father and defense attorney, and his assistant Ray Shields, as they take on Masters as their client. This is such an amazing addition to the game. You're constantly going back and forth between the past and present, so you get a really good idea of the similarities and differences between Miles and his father, and you start to realize just how strong their bond was before the fateful DL6 incident. I'm actually glad that this case is as long as it is, because honestly, I love playing as Gregory. He's just different enough for Miles to make the gameplay and interactions fun and unique. And because this case takes place in the past, we get some returning faces, such as Manfred von Karma acting as a prosecutor, and the return of Tyrell Bad as the detective from the previous game, one of the only characters I actually liked from that game. Honestly, I can't stress enough just how great the addition of Gregory is to this case, like, it, it's amazing. Of course, I wouldn't be placing it this high if it was just this. The story here actually takes a lot of twists and turns that I did not see coming at all. Like the fact that Delicia is actually not a dessert chef, but a pharmacist who entered the competition in order to sell the grand prize, and also in the present day, Dane Gustavia is somehow assaulted with a noxious gas, and we have to figure out exactly how and what happened. This case also does a really good job mending together the past and the present. Nothing feels too contrived, and everything is explained in a way that not only makes sense, but makes sense for the characters in the story. There were a few things in this case bordering on the impossible, such as the grand prize for the dessert competition being a recipe book containing a cure for a disease that causes you to lose your taste, but honestly, it doesn't really take me out of the case all that much. And now I think it's time to talk about Dane Gustavia. So, as it turns out, Dane is the culprit from the IS-7 incident from all those years ago that ended with Masters getting arrested. 
Originally, he planned on framing Delicia, since he found out all about her intentions and he actually really liked and respected Masters. But unfortunately, his plan failed due to a series of unfortunate events that left the victim's body in Masters' room. After all of this went down, he studied in Zhang Fa for a bit and came back for the grand opening, trying to clean up any and all evidence from that case 17 years ago. Through his actions and dialogue, we learn just how awful of a person Dane is. Turns out, he was diagnosed with a disease that renders one's taste useless, so he had to use his son as a taste tester. Come time for the final round and his son is a no-show. After moving to Zhang Fa, he finds a cure for his disease and decides to disown his son. That's truly despicable. But the real reason that I've singled him out like this is because barring the great Ace Attorney games, he is solely responsible for literally everything else that happens in the Ace Attorney series. What do I mean by that? Well, in killing one of the other finalists, Dane has basically created the IS-7 incident, which was wrongfully solved for 17 years until Edgeworth and Ray finally set everything in order. But what originally happened 17 years ago shaped one of the most important moments in the Ace Attorney series. As I mentioned, Gregory was the defense attorney for Masters, and Von Karma was the prosecution. The trial dragged on for over a year, with both Edgeworth and Von Karma putting up a massive fight. It wasn't until Masters decided to falsely admit to being an accomplice that the trial finally ended, with Masters behind bars. But in the process, Edgeworth was able to point out a flaw in Von Karma's evidence, awarding him his first and only penalty in his entire career. And now you realize what happened. The IS-7 incident was the direct cause for the DL-6 incident, in which Von Karma shot and killed Gregory Edgeworth in the courtroom elevator, which sent Miles Edgeworth down the path that he's on now, which caused Phoenix to go down his own path, basically leading to every single case that we've seen so far. And all of this started because a pastry chef with a killer theme decided to kill a guy for being a dick. Not the craziest thing I've said today, to be honest. If there's one thing I think we can all agree on, it's that the original trilogy really knows how to end its games. Depending on exactly which case you ended off playing the first Ace Attorney game with, you could argue that either one of those cases sees Phoenix at the high point of his career. So it only makes sense that by the end of the sequel, the final case of that game undoubtedly sees Phoenix at the lowest point of his career. Just to give you a rundown of this case before I go into how and why it manages to be one of the best cases to date, at a celebrity event, an actor by the name of Juan Corita is killed in his hotel room, and a rival actor named Matt Ongard is the main suspect. At the same exact time as this is going on, Maya is kidnapped from the event by an assassin by the name of Shelley the Killer, who says that if Phoenix does not get a not guilty verdict for Matt, he will kill Maya and he only has one day to do it. So already the stakes are set extremely high, and unlike the grand turnabout, the kidnapping is in place for the entirety of the case, so the tension never really feels like it's lowered. That's not the only thing that's changed for this case. You see, Francisca von Karma, who has been the rival prosecutor for the entire game, has been shot outside the courthouse, and now she's unable to prosecute for the case. In lieu of her, Miles Edgeworth returns to the stand once again, who we had been told for the entirety of the game was dead. Nope, turns out that he was just in another country. But now he's back, and this might be his best appearance. He's still cocky and full of himself, but he's also lost that Von Karma edge that makes him so unlikable. Now, instead of fighting for the win, he's fighting to find the truth, and it's such a good character shift for him. And despite Phoenix being mad at him for running away, and them being on opposite sides of the courtroom, Edgeworth still helps out Phoenix in order to save Maya's life. Honestly, because of Maya's kidnapping, everyone is acting this way, and it's great to see everyone doing everything they can to help out Maya, even if it goes against which side they're fighting for. 
It really shows that these characters are real human beings with real emotions and not just fighting for their cause. Okay, well, I mean, except maybe Old Bag, but is she even human to begin with? I mean, Pearl, who's basically just lost the closest person she had to a mother, is currently on the verge of losing the closest thing she had to a sister as well, yet does whatever she can to help out Phoenix during investigations and trials. Mia acts as sort of a communication between Maya and Phoenix, checking in on Maya's condition. Francisca comes back in the last moment to present some evidence that helps out Phoenix, albeit in order to get the guilty verdict, but still. And Edgeworth plays a major role, giving helpful information to Phoenix about Shelley, and stalling the trial for as long as possible so the police can catch up with the assassin and Maya. And Gumshoe, God bless his heart, he basically risks everything to save Maya, putting his job on the line to give Phoenix as much information as possible, and his life when he gets into an accident with vital evidence in hand. He seriously deserves a raise after this, I mean my god. That's not to say the new characters offer nothing, because they've got their own compelling storyline. Adrian Andrews seems like a strong and independent woman who would put up a solid fight, but we soon learn that that's all a facade, as she's actually extremely unconfident and relies heavily on other people. It's her greatest shame, and in order to get Maya out of this bind, we may just have to expose her secret, or possibly worse. Meanwhile, Shelley the Killer is a world-class assassin whose top priority is trust between himself and his client. He's clean, quick, and does the job with no questions asked. He seems like an extremely formidable foe, and the fact that he doesn't end up behind bars at the end of the case just goes to show how truly formidable he is. And at first, I wasn't too into the back-and-forth rivalry story between Matt Ongard and Juan Corita. Like, it just seemed petty at first. But then you learn about what happened to Celeste Impacts, and you see just how despicable these two men really are. She was Juan's manager, and they were in love, and even set to be married, before Juan called it off. Unable to handle it, Celeste took her own life. Juan, who came across the grisly scene, decided to forge a suicide note, listing all of Matt Ongard's misdeeds. And Matt Ongard? He's somehow even worse! Yeah, that's right, the guy you're defending in this case, the guy who seems to be nothing more than a good-looking airhead, the guy whose verdict determines Maya's fate, is actually one of the most sinister people in the entire series. Before she started dating Juan, Celeste was originally Matt Ongard's manager and girlfriend. They seemed to be in love, but it turns out that Ongard was using her to get higher standings in his career, and just threw her to the side afterwards. Upset by this, she decides to switch studios and boyfriends, hitting it off with Juan Corita instead. And despite those two actually being in love, Ongard mentions that he and Celeste used to be together to Juan, which makes him extremely upset, cancelling their wedding. And at the awards ceremony, when Juan was going to come forward with everything Matt had done, Matt decided to hire an assassin to once and for all put an end to their rivalry. Which means that, for the first time ever in this series, you're defending someone who is actually guilty. And therein lies the through line with this case being Phoenix's low point. For the first half of this case, Phoenix does whatever he can to try and clear Matt's name, thinking that he actually is innocent. In fact, he almost succeeds, thinking that Adrian Andrews is the true culprit, with a motive in everything. However, when he comes to realize that that's not the case, he confronts Matt on guard once more, and his true intentions become revealed. Phoenix already wasn't able to get a non-guilty verdict in one day, despite his best efforts, so he's on very thin ice already. He also found out that Maya wrote him a note, stating that he needs to do the right thing and get on guard a guilty verdict, and not to worry about her. And now it's up to him to decide what to do, as he has to make the most difficult decision of his entire life. If he gets on guard a not guilty verdict, Maya is free to go, but that would mean that he would have to implicate Andrews, an innocent party in the grand scheme of things, ruining her life in the process, not to mention that On Guard would freely roam the streets. But if he does get the guilty verdict, On Guard gets locked behind bars where he belongs, and Andrews is free to go, but Maya will face the ultimate price. 
So Phoenix has to choose. Follow his moral compass and make sure that Matt gets what he deserves. Or listen to his emotions and protect Maya first and foremost, no matter what choice he makes. Phoenix ends up losing no matter what. It is a thought that haunts him for the entirety of the case, and he dreads having to make the choice. Luckily in the end, it all sort of works out, with us being able to convince the killer that Matt was someone he could not trust, thereby breaking the contract between the two and setting Maya free, allowing us to push for a guilty verdict. But that doesn't negate any of the emotions that were in this case. They were on full blast. This is undoubtedly Phoenix's lowest point in his career, and it's portrayed in an emotional and extremely tight way. I mean, I guess you could argue that this isn't actually Phoenix's lowest point, and you could definitely make a case for that. Especially when talking about... Okay, so throughout this entire video, I haven't been doing the best job of hiding my true feelings towards Apollo Justice, the character, and, more importantly, the game. I honestly think that it's one of the best looking and best sounding games to date, but honestly, none of the cases I've talked about have done anything to convince me to take another look at it again in my free time. And that really boils down to weak stories, boring and extremely cliche characters, and a lack of characterization for the main character himself, Apollo. It's not the worst game in the world, but I could see why you might think that I think that. But to be honest, I wouldn't even be so harsh on the game if it wasn't for the fact that the first case of the game is one of the best cases in the entire franchise, let alone the best introduction case. Intro cases are primarily meant to introduce or reintroduce the players to the mechanics of the game, and sometimes set up the overarching story being told, unless you're Justice for All and just decide to make the worst case ever, but that's besides the point. The first case of Apollo Justice had a lot of pressure riding on its shoulders, especially since it had the added task of introducing us to a brand new set of characters since this game takes place seven years after the events of Trials and Tribulations and you're now playing as rookie attorney Apollo Justice. And despite all of that, Turnabout Trump manages to execute on every single front, and then some. Under the mentorship of Christoph Gavin, Apollo Justice is tasked with defending his first ever client in court, who just so happens to be... Phoenix, right? Yes, as it turns out, sometime seven years ago, Phoenix Wright was seemingly disbarred for presenting forged evidence in a trial, and has spent his years since as a pianist at a Russian restaurant, while also playing poker in the basement, never losing a game. Honestly, it's not shocking that we're defending Phoenix. I mean, the first case of the last game had us do the very same thing, except as Mia. What's shocking is seeing what has become of Phoenix. What was once a well-respected and morally conscious defender of truth has now seemed to turn into a guy who's just involved in some shady practices and has seemed to just... given up on doing what's morally right. In this case alone, we're given very little details as to what exactly went down all those years ago and what happened to Phoenix, but honestly, I think it's better that way. It keeps you in the dark the whole time and wondering if you're doing the right thing defending the guy, especially when it's revealed that in order to clear his name, you were basically given a piece of forged evidence that you then presented in court. Something that Phoenix himself got disbarred for so many years ago, and something Phoenix has stated on multiple accounts, is a huge deal. So to see him just... do this so nonchalantly to clear his name? No wonder Apollo punched him after this case was over. Then there's also the relationship between Kristoff and Phoenix that's explored in this case. At the beginning, it seems like they're pretty good friends, and Apollo defending him is a favor from Phoenix. However, you can just sort of feel the tension in the air before the trial starts, as if there's sort of a strain in their friendship, and as they'll soon figure out, it goes a lot deeper than that. You start by defending Phoenix, who seems to know a lot about what actually went down that night, yet continues to insist that he's innocent. While he does seem a bit suspicious, he's able to make a lot of clear points. However, things take a turn when he reveals a conversation between himself and Kristoff that he recovered over the phone, 
in which Kristoff slipped up and mentioned something he wouldn't have known unless he was at the scene of the crime. Suddenly, the tables have turned, and Phoenix is back at the defense bench, while Kristoff is being asked to provide testimony. And I assure you, it's quite based. You're able to expose Kristoff's scheme and send him to jail, but there are some things that just don't quite add up. But before we discuss that, let's talk about the gameplay of this case. Now, despite all the twists and turns that this case has, and how much it leaves us in the dark, and how great it is at setting up the characters and mysteries, it is still an introductory case, and its primary job is still to explain and utilize the basic mechanics of the trial system. I've criticized previous introduction cases for feeling like it was treading on old ground, or finding a convoluted reason to reintroduce the basics, or just being plain boring. I'm happy to say, though, that Turnabout Trump does a spectacular job handling the duties of an intro case. Because we're in a new era, and because we're using new characters, it actually makes sense for us within the story to be reintroduced to the mechanics of the game, not only because in-universe this is Apollo's first case that he's handling, but also because for a lot of people, this will be their first ever Ace Attorney game. And yet, despite that second part, it's able to explain how the game is played in a way that is easy to understand, but at the same time doesn't overstay its welcome. Once the case explains how it works, it sort of lets you take control from there and experience the amazing story. And the story leaves you with so many questions. Why exactly did Kristoff kill the victim? Were his motives as simple as send right to jail, or was there something deeper to it? And has Phoenix hit such a low point in his life since his disbarment that he actually let Apollo use forged evidence? What has gotten him to this point? And why does it feel like he knows more than he lets on? These questions and more meander in your mind throughout the whole game, and I wish I could say that the payoff was executed well, but that's really not the fault of this case. One thing about this case that I see come up is that it doesn't really feel like Apollo gets any character moments at all, as it sort of just feels like it's a Phoenix versus Kristoff thing. And to that I say, A, it's an introduction case, so it makes sense why we don't dive deep into his character, as that's saved for later cases and games. And B, the mystery between Phoenix and Kristoff is easily the best part of the case, so I'm all for that. You could argue that we really don't get any more characterization for Apollo in the rest of the game as well, and the ones that we do get in later games are just convoluted additions to his mysterious backstory. But again, that's not the fault of this case. Turnabout Trump's job was to introduce us to these new characters, this new era of law, and the mysteries waiting for us to solve them in the future. It's the other case's faults for failing on that execution, and that's just what I find so fascinating about Turnabout Trump. It's able to outshine literally everything that comes after it with its extremely competent writing and setup. I just, I cannot believe that the intro case to Apollo Justice is actually this amazing. Even people who hate Apollo Justice say that this is easily the best case of the game, so clearly they at least got something right when making this game. I mean, it has to have been great given its placement on this list. Number two best Ace Attorney case is an extremely high honor, but there's just one case that trumps even this one. If you've been keeping track of this list, you probably saw this one coming. Hell, even if you haven't, if you played the games before, chances are that you still saw this one coming. It might seem like an extremely obvious choice to put the finale from Trials and Tribulations as the best case in the entirety of the series, but honestly, that's because Bridge to the Turnabout deserves all of the praise. With the ending of the first game being the high point of Phoenix's story, and the ending of the second game being the low point of Phoenix's story, the ending of the third game acts as the ending of Phoenix's story. Not just his story, actually, but the ending of a lot of characters' stories. Mia, Maya, Pearl, Edgeworth, Gumshoe, Franziska, even Larry, and Godot and Dahlia as well, but we'll discuss them in due time. 
This was originally supposed to be the final game in the Ace Attorney series, and while I'm glad that it continued, giving us games like Dual Destinies and The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, I could absolutely see this being the last game of the series, since the ending does such a good job wrapping up everybody's stories. There is a reason that the OG trilogy is so beloved after all. I could go into a lot of details about all the characters and how they impact the story and how the stories are wrapped up, but I'm only going to focus on a few here. While visiting the Hazakura Temple with Maya and Pearl, Phoenix comes across an individual named Iris, who has a very similar resemblance to Dahlia Hawthorne. This leaves him extremely suspicious of her, especially when another character introduced in this chapter, who ends up being Maya's long-lost mother, is killed, and Iris is the primary suspect. Phoenix has to take her case despite his reservations, and he's all alone this time, as Maya is trapped on another mountain with no way to access her for the time being, and Pearl being lost somewhere at the temple, meaning that not even Mia can help him from the beginning. Of course, even Phoenix is out of commission since he's hospitalized for falling off the bridge into the icy cold river. So, for the first part of the trial, you get to play as... Edgeworth. Yep, predating the Investigations games, you actually play as Edgeworth for like a third of this case. He's acting as a defense attorney, and since Godot is MIA for whatever reason, he has Franziska act as the prosecutor. This is such an amazing area of the game, both the investigations and the trial. Seeing Edgeworth's inner monologues and how it differs from Phoenix is so much fun, and him facing off against Franziska is a great way to end both their stories, while also giving Edgeworth a taste of the defense attorney life that he comes to question his path over in the second Investigations game. When Phoenix takes over again for the remainder of the trial, everything starts coming into play. The bridge is repaired, but Maya is locked away in the cave and they're unable to get her out. Godot reappears and is looking forward to taking you down in court. And on the plus side, Pearl is found, and that means we now have access to Mia again, who becomes very vital later on in this case. Edgeworth also reveals that Dahlia Hawthorne died in prison, meaning that Iris couldn't be Dahlia. Or at least not physically. And now we can shift focus to the two characters who make this case as strong as it is. Dahlia makes her grand return here, this time as a Spectre. We've seen just how cruel of a person she can be in the first and fourth case, basically showing herself to be an outright monster. Turns out that in her time in prison, she met up with Morgan Fay from the second case of Justice for All, and they devised a plan to finally get revenge on Mia Fay by killing Maya as Pearl, which would then make Pearl the head honcho of the Spirit Medium clan. This really just goes to show how awful this person truly is, but then you learn that Dahlia Hawthorne is actually the daughter of Morgan Fay, making her Pearl's sister and Mia and Maya's cousin. So Dahlia basically goes out of her way to destroy her family just because of what Mia did in the first case. She's literally the most heartless person in the entire series, and to see her get her comeuppance is so satisfying. And then there's Goodell. At this point, even if it's not revealed to the characters, it's obvious that Godot is Diego Armando, Mia's boyfriend who was poisoned by Dahlia, leaving him in a coma for five years. When he awoke, he was blind and his hair was white, but with the help of a visor, the former was no longer a problem, albeit he couldn't make out the color red. He also learned what happened to Mia during his coma, and blames himself and Phoenix for not being able to save her, ergo his harbored hatred for Phoenix. I wouldn't really call Godot a villain. I mean, in the end, it was him that killed Misty Fay, but he did it in order to protect Maya. Even then, he never wanted to kill Misty, he just wanted to get rid of Dahlia Hawthorne once and for all, and he does pay for those actions come the end of the game. Other than his absolute hatred for Phoenix, there's nothing that points to him being a villain, but he is definitely an antagonist, and probably the best one in the series to date. Godot is an extremely tragic antagonist. In the span of one fatal action caused by Dahlia Hawthorne, he nearly lost everything. His job, his sight, the woman he loved. When he came to, he was filled with only vengeance and hatred towards Dahlia, and especially Phoenix. And yet, no matter what, 
he continued to deal with his problems on his own instead of just talking to someone. He becomes a prosecutor just so that he can measure up Phoenix Wright and try to crush him. He refuses to show any signs of weakness, even up against much more difficult and physically stronger odds. And, in his most fatal mistake, upon hearing of Morgan and Dahlia's plan in prison, instead of reporting what was said to the cops, he takes matters into his own hands so that he can finally get his vengeance. But things go wrong. He thought he was the only one who could protect Maya from these awful people, but in reality, he made something even worse happen. When Dahlia was possessing Misty's body, Godot could only see his pure hatred for Dahlia and stabbed her through the back, effectively killing Maya's mother right in front of her, and in the process, implicating her own cousin in order to protect her. By the time we get to the finale of Bridge to the Turnabout, Dahlia has been taken care of, but the murder of Misty is still up in the air, with Maya being the main suspect. And now Godot has backed himself into a corner. He needs to prove that Maya didn't do the dirty deed, but to do so would mean that he would have to come clean. And for the first time in the entire game, Godot doesn't take things into his own hands. Instead, he has Phoenix Wright, the guy who he has been endlessly tormenting through the entirety of the game, take him down. I know a lot of people have said this before, but Godot is a flawed character, and that's what makes him so great. Unlike someone like Von Karma, or Edgeworth, or Franziska, or whatever other prosecutors you face, he's nowhere near perfect. He makes mistakes constantly, and he has to pay for what he does. He's also not an undefeated god of the courtroom, he's literally just a newbie prosecutor who uses his own personality and skills to speak for himself, and sometimes through his own wrongdoings, he makes mistakes both in and out of the courtroom. Even on his mission to protect Maya, which was his main priority, he messes up to the point that he questions whether or not he protected Maya at all, or if he actually, in his rage-induced vengeance, killed her own mother right in front of her. He goes onto the prosecutor bench the next day with the same gusto as always, but having taken a human life, he truly wants Wright to come to the truth and save Maya once and for all, with no help from Mia whatsoever. And when that happens, he finally shows his respect and gratitude for Wright. And Phoenix! I mean, what else is there to even say about his arc? While Dahlia was more of a personal vendetta for Mia in the long run, and ergo it was Mia who actually really helped land the final blow, it's all on Phoenix to once and for all put away the true killer of Misty Fay. After everything that he's been through at this point, I don't think there's anything better than the climax of the case, when the 2001 music kicks in and Phoenix is able to piece together everything. Nothing will ever beat this scene. This is truly the end of Phoenix's story. We've seen him go from a novice defense attorney making tons of mistakes and constantly doubting himself, as well as relying on the help of others, to this competent defense attorney that is able to hold his own in court against his most formidable and personal foe yet. Even with the subsequent games, this truly does feel like the closing chapter to Phoenix's story. And they went out with the best case in the entire Ace Attorney series. I mean, honestly, I don't even know what to say anymore. My name is Phoenix Wright, head of the Wright Anything Agency and a lawyer. Let's just say there's unfinished business to take care of. I 
actually didn't grow up with the Ace Attorney series like a lot of other people did, so I might not hold the same sentimental value that a lot of people watching this video might hold. So your opinions could be greatly different from mine. Hell, you might hate Bridge to the Turnabout, and also absolutely adore the Lost Turnabout, and that's totally okay. I mean, I wouldn't want to be near you in public, but it's still okay. That's the thing about these cases, and even the games as a whole. Even though I was extremely hard on a lot of these cases, that doesn't mean they're devoid of things I like. And even the cases that I sang the praises of have some aspects that I can't stand. You might like aspects that I hate and hate aspects that I love, and that's okay. What's great about these cases is that they're so diverse and unique in the content that there's going to be something for everybody. Literally every game is going to have a case that you're going to enjoy, or at the very least, a case with aspects that you enjoy. So don't let my conflicting opinions get in the way of you experiencing these games, whether it be a replay or for the first time. The likelihood of a new Ace Attorney game is still very much in the air, and while I'd like to see the series continue, 11 games and over 50 cases is a pretty dang good legacy. So even if this is the end, I'm always going to continue to enjoy these cases and this series for the rest of my life. Anyways, uh, I don't know how to end this, so okay, bye! And with that, your honor, I rest my case. <laughs>
Order! Order in the court! Defendant, you have wasted enough of everyone's time with your inadmissible evidence and bashing of culture, especially those of your jury peers who are deciding your fate as we speak. Those weren't jury peers, those were Judy Greer's. And I'm at least 80% positive that their cardboard cutouts too! Defendant, I now have the final verdict in my hand. Wait, where did you- Daniel T. Mansworth, That's you are hereby found guilty of 26 counts of copyright infringement, in addition to being held in contempt of court for wasting everyone's time with that inadmissible and overused evidence format. What? And while I've acted as an unbiased figure throughout this entire trial, I'm extremely happy to serve you with the worst punishment that is known to mankind, to be enforced immediately. A forced marketable redesign. Court is adjourned. Wait a second, what did he say? A forced market? What, what does that even mean?